Hi, my name is Dhanya Shankar and I am reading this book for the author as a volunteer and I grant permission for this tape to be used by him for his personal or commercial use. Preface Dear Reader, Last year, in 2020, when I published my book, Conversation with Mr. Sensix, I realized that it lacked something. Although I was completely satisfied with its structure and its content, I felt that it expressed many of my thoughts in vague forms. In that work, I had also refrained myself from giving real-life examples which had its own strength since it allowed me to express complex topics in metaphorical ways which some readers felt as complex and unclear. That was its disadvantage. So, I was waiting for a new concept, a new idea to revise my thoughts about investing in the stock market and re-enter with a book that could help other retail investors in their journey. I also didn't want to write unnecessary chatter which would only act as an orgasm of inspiration, but something which truly contributed to the subject something which was verifiable and new that would give a new sight to the learner. And it came. One day, I was sitting on our terrace, pondering about the stocks I had made investment in or had researched about. I realized that there was a pattern which kept repeating. I penned these patterns in a book, which eventually became the chapters and the kinds of multibaggers as you see today. I also wanted to write a book which I myself would prefer to read if I go back in the past when I began. That is what Common Sense and Multibaggers is all about. A book which any person without a financial background could read and understand no matter what his age is as long as he can read and write. Author name Kalpesh Suryavanshi. Date 11th of May 2021. Chapter 1. Concept of Multibaggers Quote, A significant difference between an investor and a non-investor is that the former understands inflation and its consequences. Unquote by Kalpesh Suryamanshi Multibaggers are like true love. You realize it when it is already too late. But unlike love, multibaggers are not limited there is no age at which to discover multibaggers. They, of course, are rare, but possibility of finding them is equal for all of us. We just need the right lens to see which this book aims to achieve. Traditionally, multibaggers are stocks that give you multiple times return on your investment. So, if a stock doubles your money, then it is called a two-bagger. If it multiplies your investment by 10 times, then it is 10 baggers. And if it turns your principal 100 times, then we call it a 100 bagger. Now, there is some limitation to this traditional definition of stock as it fails to consider the time taken by the stock to become a multi-bagger as well as the cost of stock to become a multi-bagger. While the fact is that time alone is what assigns value to our investment and ignoring the time itself causes discrepancy in our definition. You see, stock A might take one year to double your money, while stock B might take five years, yet we refer to them as multibaggers, knowing the fact that one was quicker in its approach while the other slower. Therefore, it is necessary to change this definition so as to reflect equal clarity about both time and the cause which generated such exceptional returns. We are no more in the 19th or 20th century. The world has changed significantly in the past decade alone. And with the pace of internet and technology, it is expected to be faster in the future as well. But when it comes to our teaching and learning curriculum, it is still the same as it was a century ago. Of course, we have changed the medium through which we teach, like we use the internet, videos and projectors, etc. But the content has remained the same. Our books outwardly are designed differently, but what is within is still the same. And the effect of all these is seen in the investment world also. 
we are still using the old wisdom in our modern times we are still dragging the previous definitions to this era which is unsuitable and thus we need to revolutionize the way we see hear and perceive things Keeping up with the word, I shall then classify the multibaggers in various types according to their kind, pattern, behavior, and time at which they are conceived. In the upcoming chapters, we shall see various kinds of multibaggers and the ways in which they manifest, which will help you understand and identify them in a better way. Now, one may ask, why the need to classify? Why the need to redefine? The answer lies in your question itself. We update things because they are not suitable for the current situation anymore. Besides, the classification and definition of patterns is necessary, which shall serve as an identity, a mark for you to recognize them based on their type and kind. Now, how can you find something of which you have no idea about? See, you already know the traditional definition of multibagger, but what help does that definition provide you? The traditional definition is itself designed in a way that it reflects the past. It tells you when a stock becomes a multibagger, call it 10, 50 or 100 bagger. But this definition tells you nothing about how it became a multibagger or how much time it took to become a multibagger. Besides, it tells you nothing on how to identify one by your own. Imagine if I told you to find a pen in a room full of pens, which writes, then what pen would you give me? The room is full with pens, numerous of various inks, shapes and sizes. Therefore, my information, my definition of pen to you is incomplete. Such is the case with the current definition of multibaggers. They lack preciseness, which a beginner needs. A beginner needs clarity of thought so he can learn and practice fishing multibaggers for himself. And if not catch one, but at least recognize them beforehand with the signs we have given. My sole aim through this book is to give you that vision which shall help you to identify multibaggers with mere use of your common sense, which is quite uncommon these days. Chapter 2 Multibaggers Redefined Quote, Lucky enough to have discovered your passion? Invest in it even if it costs your life. Unquote, by Kalpesh Suryavanshi. The world today is changing rapidly and so is our market. The rise of cheap internet and conditions like the current pandemic of COVID-19, work from home has become a new norm. Also, the rise of social media, blogs, YouTube channels have brought an interest in investing for the average which has given birth to the idea that money is not only a means to buy but also to invest. It is like all the right things are happening at the right time which in a market we call the period of boom. Introduction of discount broking firms have given birth to a generation of new kinds of traders. We can buy and sell our stocks faster than the blink of our eyes. The softwares and algos, which were once only the tools of the hedge funds, are now available to the common man. Investing in stocks is a new trend which perhaps has just begun and is expected to continue for the decade or even more. This, all in totality, has changed the structure of the market. Stocks, which once rarely had any volume, are seen as top gainers on the bourses. Small caps and mid caps have both overperformed the blue chips and the broader market as a whole. Also, the market today appears comparatively more volatile because of the conditions going on and yet the newbies of the market are willing to take the risk. They are willing to bet higher during the highs and even higher during the lows. So the new generation of India is no more as risk averse as it was a decade ago. Today we have websites and softwares which give us timely reports of corporate ongoings. We can schedule and attend live meetings of the board. Besides, there are abundant free reviewing blogs and channels which give analysis reports to novice investors. The details related to numbers, statements and financial ratios all are just a few clicks away. 
the investor of 21st century no more has to spend his time searching for data in heaps of paper. He no more has to spend hours calculating the P.E. or net book value of stock, which was once a privilege in itself. Sometimes this too much information is overwhelming and confusing, but it is much better than the past. However, by noting all the positives about this century, I don't mean to emphasize that the investing process or the process of generating returns has become easier. Investing is still as tiring as it was a decade ago. Returns are as hard to generate as they were a decade ago. Access to information doesn't guarantee success, but at least we can say that the gap between the institutions and the retail investors has reduced and we can say that in a way, today they are on equal footing. Lastly, as it always has been, your work and dedication alone shall determine how you use your resources and where it takes you. But there is always an opportunity which lies hidden in every adversity. To be successful investors, we have to take the right steps at the right time. Let us now move on with our new definition of multibaggers. I would rather call this as reconceptualization than calling it as redefinition. According to my proposal, any stock which helps you generate returns greater than 50%, be it in a week or year, should be termed as multibagger. By this definition then, every stock trading on the bursus become a potential multibagger. Almost all stocks in their lifetime have all given returns greater than 50%. If you go through the chart, the lifetime stock chart of any great company or a failed company, you will see that at some phase it has given returns greater than 50%. Therefore, now your possibilities of finding a multibagger is not restricted to only stable or known companies, but to the worst of the worst stocks. According to our definition, all stocks have the potentiality of being a multibagger, but what matters now is the time of our entry and that of our exit. Verily, the way I am proposing might seem risky and in a way appear as if I am encouraging you to trade rather than our previous old wisdom of buy and hold. But such shall not be the case in actuality. As we shall move ahead in our chapters, one may realize that it won't be our choice to trade or hold, but the circumstance and its demand which shall be the decision maker. So far, you just stick to our definition and understand that all stocks have the potential to be a multibagger and we can take their benefit if we learn to recognize them, which of course I'll be teaching you in this book. Chapter 3. Limitations of Numbers Quote, Interest is a reward for delayed gratification. The prudent earns it while the negligent pays it. Unquote by Kalpesh Suryavanshi. Why use the method prescribed in this book instead of going by the methods of numbers, financials and formulas? Surely I am telling you to use common sense, but that doesn't mean that you stop using your higher sense, your intellect. We, in today's world, have robo-advisors and algos which have the capacity to manage and execute our trades on our behalf, that too with least or zero human intervention. The reason for all this possibility is nothing but the power of numbers. Our computers are masters when it comes to crunching those numbers and are almost flawless when it is about taking decisions based on numbers. So in a way, they too have a potential of being great investors and perhaps one day we might have a successful AI investor slash trader. But all this has limitations and the reason is the numbers itself. Market, as we see today, is still a game dominated by emotions. Stocks today still reflect the emotions of traders in their volatility. A pandemic is about to occur or has occurred. CEO has committed suicide. The renowned flight of that company has crashed, etc. are the emotional situations which the computer cannot perceive. These are anticipatory situations which significantly impact the movement of stocks daily. Every week, there is a new multibagger. 
a multi-bagger which be so due to the above reasons and this is why we still need humans to run our investment world since we can anticipate certain events based on emotions alone. It is not machines that are profit oriented but us and so it is our duty to be aware of the ongoings in our system. Global situations like earthquakes, elections, wars, tsunamis, etc. are things which cause a threat not instantaneously but later in the time but our market cannot wait for the impact. It is a reacting mechanism. It acts today based on what will happen tomorrow. Therefore, when it comes to predicting and preparing for the future, numbers provide only a little help. And the limitation of machines in these matters can be understood as well as is justified. But we as men are not in that position. We can anticipate situations we can predict outcomes not with numbers but with common sense alone. We can anticipate how market may react if BJP party comes in power instead of Congress. We can determine in a way the policies of RBI. We know what the country needs, what the economy expects and this sense alone is enough to fetch us few multibaggers. Should we then ditch the formulas and valuation methods? Is common sense sufficient to get rich? I would say partly, as discussed earlier. The strength of numbers alone is not sufficient and so does the dependency on common sense alone. As we shall progress further in chapters, you will realize the importance of both logic as well as emotions. As far as the formulas or valuation models or softwares are concerned, they too are necessary but only to some extent. Sometimes we may get deals which are called as value deals and also deals which are referred as expensive but both in a way are going to be profitable and only reason for this is going to be our timing. The whole gist of this book is based on timing. How to recognize the right time to enter and the time to exit is all what we need which may certainly sound easier on paper but much difficult in practice. But always remember that more practice and more experience you gain, easier will it get for you to apply the principles of this book. Take an example, India's biggest wealth destroyers, Reliance Communications and Videocon Industries, both were also one of the greatest wealth creators. Both of the stocks had given exceptional returns to their investors in just few years of their launch before their debacle in 2007-8 crisis. Currently, they both trade at their lifetime lows, struggling for volume as penny stocks. Should we then stop referring them as multibaggers? If we consider the time frame, then we can say that they both had their heydays and now are going through their May Day, but that doesn't undermine their previous height. For those who failed to book profits and got swayed away during the crisis have been so because of their own fault. Rcom as well as Videocon, both as all companies struggled, survived, peaked and are struggling again. That is how the lifetime of most businesses is. That's how they start and that's how they all end. Even the too big to fail companies do fail. You have numerous examples of the past. Sony, Nokia, Xerox, IBM are some to name a few. Their products which go out of line, plans which turn into disasters, decisions which cause the debacle, all these things are not often the games of numbers but emotions. Nokia's tie-up with Microsoft was a decision they still are regretting. One with some sense of future could clearly see the outcome and get out by selling his stock before the numbers even enter the scenario. So a sense of ongoing could save you a lot of time, trouble and money. This sense is valuable which machines don't possess. Neither are their numbers to see of it, but we as humans have the sense. We can polish it with experience and make it sharper. So in our next chapter, we shall start with our first classification of multibaggers. But before we reach there, I need you to note a few things. Number one, take a pen and paper to note important points which are yet to come. Number two, go through the examples as soon as you read them. Number three, try to put your own thoughts on each upcoming topic and find similar examples relating to it. 
Number four, discuss the topic with your friends, which will help you to grasp them better with the effort of memorizing them. Number five, lastly, don't forget to submit an honest review about this book on Amazon or Flipkart, whichever site you buy from. Chapter four, bye-bye examples. Quote, it is easy to teach those who know nothing Difficult to teach those who know something and almost impossible to teach those who think they know everything. Unquote by Kalpesh Suryavanshi. This is not a dedicated chapter but a prequel. Some essentials before we dive into our real work. Without the mention of this chapter, our work and our study about the subject shall remain incomplete. You might have known that learning with the help of examples becomes easier. Complex stuff can be simplified with examples and metaphors, which is why we often see the wide use of examples in every field of study. The mention of examples, which are live and demonstrable, also adds up as a proof to the conceptualized theory. But there are also certain drawbacks of giving examples. And to explain the drawbacks of example, I shall still use an example which is ironic in itself. Suppose you, as you are, were blind from your birth and you had no idea of colors and how objects around you look like. Then, by a chance of luck, you get a donor and your sight is replaced and you start seeing things. Now, for some reason, you ask me how red color looks like. And I use the tomato in front of you, showing that the way tomato looks like is what the color of red. So you fit that definition in your mind and start calling all shades of tomato red. Some tomatoes are orange, some yellowish, some greenish, but overall they all have a hint of red. And so every shade of red, despite minute differences, is still red to you. This is what I called the drawback of examples. Examples make you think according to a framework. They restrict your thinking into a particular model and when you come across things which don't fit that model of yours, you then discard it thinking it as useless. This way, your vision of knowledge too gets confined within a boundary and anything outside it becomes alien to you. This kind of alienation and unfamiliarity causes you to leave many significant and important things which perhaps could change your life. Our natural instinct is to search for patterns. We try to find sense even in the nonsense which is how we see things. That is how we perceive the world around us. Yet, the same method cannot be used while investing. We certainly have categorized businesses in their models and various industries, but no two businesses are ever alike, even if they are in the same industry or following the same business model. No two banks, no two motor companies, no two IT firms are alike. They all have their own strengths as well as weaknesses, and so all businesses like us are all unique in their own ways. That doesn't mean that examples serve no purpose. They do, which is why I'm writing this book, giving you patterns on how to identify multibaggers. But it was also necessary to let you know the limitations of examples. I don't want you to pick up an example from my book and start finding a replica of it in the market. Cause if you do so, then you are destined to fail. In further chapters, I shall give examples and patterns to identify but not use them as ultimate ideals. Time changes. Businesses changes. A multibagger today may not be the multibagger tomorrow. A rough business today might turn smooth tomorrow and vice versa. These are not the laws of physics which we are discussing, which you may expect to remain the same for centuries. Our discussion is of businesses which just like you and me are alive. They are born, they die, they succeed and fail. As far as the definitions I give you, the patterns I teach you shall all remain the same regardless of time. The patterns and definitions are like the nets which you use to catch the fish. In brackets, fish on the other hand will be the examples. Bracket closed. Some nets can catch only one kind of fish, while some nets can catch all kinds of fish. 
Also, don't worry if you don't understand this metaphor now. As we shall progress in our chapters ahead, this all should start making sense. Chapter 5 Evergreen Multibaggers Quote Hard work is overrated. Patience is underrated. Unquote By Kalpesh Suryavanshi There are trees that remain green all the seasons. There are forests that remain green all the year. There are things which don't lose their charm throughout their life. We call them evergreen. So do we have companies and stocks which don't lose their might? Their profits, revenue and their stock chart in the long run is always ascending higher, climbing and breaking records year by year. As discussed earlier, companies like us are born, survive and die. Some have longer lifespans while some shorter, but all aim to achieve progress, which some do and some don't. There are certain industries which by their origin have longer lifespan and some business models which have comparatively stronger hold in the market. For example, industries like FMCG, IT, banks, etc. are some which have a longer duration of survival while industries like telecom, internet, airline, etc. are ones which are very competitive and have cutthroat competition which is generally harmful for the companies that fall in that category. Regardless of it, multi-baggers are everywhere because a great company has learned to survive in that situation and can very well capitalize on it. Talking of business models, overall B2C business models tend to have an edge over other models like B2B. Often B2C models are easier to scale, run and also easier for investors to understand which helps them to make an estimate about the future earnings as well as their risks. Therefore, our kind of evergreen multibaggers can be found in one of these two areas or even both. Evergreen multibaggers are the ones which you are typically taught to identify in your so-called investing courses, books and lectures. These are the businesses which most great investors of today had invested in the early days. These are the businesses which have made our today's billionaires and perhaps shall keep making them. The profile of these businesses is such that they hold a competitive advantage over their peers. Some even have a monopoly or an exceptional product or service. All this gives them above average numbers in their statements, which then the management uses effectively to scale further, franchise and expand. Their business is not confined to any rules of the market because they are actually the rule makers. They are the trendsetters. Having said all that, it should also be obvious by now that such businesses and their management are solely customer oriented and operate in a strong ethical business environment. Numerically, these businesses generally have a ROE greater than 15%. They also tend to have a stable balance sheet, some of which are often net debt free. As far as their sales or revenue is concerned, it is normally better than their competitors, which might range from 15 to 30 percent or more growth per year, depending on their industry and area of operations. Also, most of the evergreen multi-bagger companies tend to pay regular dividends, but some often decide to reinvest and offer it to shareholders via other means. Warren Buffett's favorite dairy queen, Jeff Bezos, Amazon, Mukesh Ambani's Reliance, Rakesh Junjunwala's Dream Stock Titan, and many of such companies which can be termed as evergreen multibaggers. Our India's FMCG sector alone has many such evergreen multibaggers that have survived for multiple decades, like that of Hindustan Unilever, ITC Limited, Gillette India, Daba India, Colgate Palmolive, etc. In our IT industry, we have Infosys. LNT Tech, HCL, etc. In banking, we have HDFC, Axis, and State Bank of India, in brackets, SBI alone is one of the successful PSUs of India. Here, it is evergreen compared with other PSUs, not with our private players. Bracket closed. One might also say that this list more or less contains examples which are blue chip companies and you're definitely right in noticing it, but it is not that they started like this. All of these had a humble beginning. 
all of these started with zero and today since i am giving you these examples in hindsight they appear to be blue chips as an investor who wants to earn by investing who wants to stay in the game for a longer period of time should focus on these kind of multi baggers you don't have to buy them when they are big but have to fish them while they are small i have made it easier for you by stating the characteristics patterns and models there is already a bunch of literature around on how to find these kinds of multi baggers people generally when they use the word multi bagger they often mean exactly this kind this kind which keeps growing year by year this kind which is relatively stable and safer this kind which is suitable for all ages and for all people having a kind of risk appetite evergreen multi baggers are actually the easiest kind of multi baggers to find but what is difficult is to stick with our choice and trust our gut instinct no matter what happens it is like planting a mango tree it won't start bearing fruits in a short time frame but shall take years and for that you need nothing but patience many people often regret selling these kind of stocks they are too quick to get out and miss out the complete journey also evergreens are easy to find and invest since it is never too late to invest in these businesses one thing should also be noted here that by evergreen it doesn't mean that these businesses won't ever perish they will eventually the problem is most people consider investing in stocks as a passive activity which is not true at all unlike the bond market or real estate market our stocks change prices daily our management changes yearly we hire new staff we let retire the old we launch a new product line we also abandon the previous line so every day there is an update in the business which eventually changes its valuation so no matter what business or stock you fall in love with don't ever decide to marry it love your stocks but don't marry them because you know divorce is quite expensive these days buy them and stay invested in these businesses as long as they are profitable as long as they stick to their core business activity as long as their market share is strong as long as they have no significant competitor as long as the management is sound as long as they are paying their dues and taxes on time but if anything above goes sideways if anything seems wrong if anything about the core business or the management has done fraud you should know it's time to get out it's time to sell you see when there is a tsunami or an earthquake it does not occur just in a moment even nature gives you signs warnings and time to escape from the disaster so does the market our mighty evergreen businesses won't go bust in a day if there is a crisis a problem then it too will show signs at least one of the above i stated earlier but if you fail to notice those signs and you fail to escape then nobody except you is to be blamed for the mess you are in most common cause of the failure of evergreen businesses is either the rise of a new significant competitor debt or change in the core of business activity look what amazon has done to the brick and mortar retailers in america look what jio has done to idea and vodafone look what zeroda has done to the full time brokers all these are new age business strategies which have caused an end to an era of decade old businesses the evergreen businesses as they were once so of course every business today or tomorrow shall fade and lose its charm but if you are lucky and smart enough to grab it when it is still young and has potential to expand then you are definitely on your way to wealth dmart today is one of this kind it is a young evergreen multi bagger they still have only less than 250 stores all over india can they scale it up higher sure the growth potential for dmart in india is limitless why not 500 stores why not 5000 more than 50% of population in india still lives in rural areas which depend on brick and mortar retailers for essentials as well as non essentials we have only a handful of metros but hundreds of small towns and cities where dmart has the potential to make a presence dmart on their business front has all what they need a smart and shrewd founder a strong management top class balance sheet and abundance of capital plus a proven and lasting business model 
they too will have some hiccups and potholes in their journey but that alone is a test test whether it truly is one of the kind we think it to be Reliance and Amazon as stated earlier both corporations have destroyed numerous industries and businesses with their presence and have now entered the area of demart Amazon with its online presence Prime Plans is trying to provide one day delivery to its customers while Reliance with its retail subsidiary too has launched an e-commerce platform which is a direct threat to our young and potential evergreen multibagger demart Since I'm writing this book in the middle of their battle and that too in the middle of this pandemic which has caused great volatility in the market it has become difficult to accurately predict the case of Demart but if Demart succeeds in outshining its competitors and stands tall securing its spot as a friendly nearby discount retail store then the result shall continue as predicted our Demart shall one day be the blue chip of tomorrow stable and relatively safe now then we have three stages of multi bagging the evergreens stage 1 get in enter with an expectation a story or at least a direction know why you are entering that investment vehicle and where it should take you stage 2 stay be invested as long as things go on according to what you have planned as long as your expectations match with the reality stage 3 get out sell when anything seems fishy anything that seems to risk your principal and your future anything that is a shock or an unplanned event which shall cause permanent damage to your company in our example of demart which we assume to be an evergreen multibagger we have thought well about all three stages stage 1 In case Demart is the expectation it is the possibility that it can easily scale up to 5000 stores at least in the upcoming future all over India if such becomes possible then the stock of Demart still has a potential to give five bagger return in the near future stage 2 is the stage where we are now at the testing phase where it has to prove itself by outshining its competitors stage 3 then would be the case of failure If Demart fails to meet our targets, expectations and to beat the competition, then we can expect its dream run to end. Now that you know the definition of evergreens, their kind or their pattern and by being equipped with your knowledge about the three stages of multibagging, I expect you to now search on for more similar stocks or companies. Mind you it won't be easy due to the fact that such knowledge takes time to reward you and such ain't of any help if you are inexperienced you should be well versed with the history of these businesses which you ought to inspect and along with it you should have an understanding of the future not limited to the company and its peers but also extended to the whole industry in which it is operating there is a reason why warren buffett still reads more than 500 pages a week Every investor who wants to have evergreen multibaggers in his portfolio should have this quality of supervision. Read not only to find new picks but to supervise your existing ones. You should know all about the corporate ongoings, company policies, management changes, product launches, competitors and so on. In a way, these kinds of multibaggers are also most exhausting mentally but also rewarding financially. It is easy to find them but tiring to supervise them as sometimes they might take up a great part of your life in reading stuff which perhaps you won't enjoy but again you have to like what you do or start doing what you like since there is no other option if you find all this act to be boring and joyless then perhaps evergreen multibaggers are not for you if you can't sit and hold without panic then perhaps long term investing isn't your cup of tea So if you want to be rich and successful you either learn and stick to evergreen multibaggers because that's how most wealth is made till date but if this seems too much don't worry for we have many chapters on multibaggers yet to come the right kind the right method will eventually strike you and sooner or later you'll know what exactly you need and can do Chapter 6 Valuation Multibaggers Quote Invest in education and the rest shall take care of itself 
unquote, by Kalpesh Suryavanshi. Seven months ago, on September 5th, 2020, I had uploaded a video titled, in double quotes, Info Edge, Company with Potential, unquote, on my YouTube channel, which was initially named as, under quotes, Mr. Sensix. But today, it is renamed as my own name, that is, in quotes, Kalpesh Suryavanshi. It was the time when the tale of Zomato IPO was still fresh and the market was undergoing a phase of recovery. At the time of upload, the company InfoEdge was trading at a stock price of somewhere around 3,250 rupees per share, which valued the company then at approximately 42,000 crore rupees in terms of market capitalization. Now, InfoEdge is a holding company which owns directly or indirectly a stake in various companies specifically towards the internet and tech industry. During the said period, InfoEdge had a stake of around 22% in Zomato and 15% stake in Policy Bazaar, which both were renowned startups, as they call, in quotes, unicorns of India. Since both startups were so huge and popular, various news channels already used to track and report their growth stories actively. Zomato was then valued at 3 billion US dollars, while Policy Bazaar was valued at perhaps 2 billion US dollars. Now, anyone with common sense could reach a calculation, a number of which InfoEdge has a share in both the companies. According to our above sources, InfoEdge had 22% of 3 billion US dollars in Zomato and 19% in 2 billion US dollars of Policy Bazaar, which at that time gave me a number of 10 to 12k crores in INR. So, if the IPOs, both of them get listed at the bourses, are overscribed and if they trade twice than their offered price at their listing, or perhaps a few months after listing, they not only double investors' value, but also the InfoEd's stake value. It was a simple conclusion. More growth Zomato and Policy Bazaar C, more beneficial would it turn out for the shareholders of InfoEdge. So I put this video out with the same conclusion and in just two months, the stock touched its all-time high of 5,000 rupees per share, which is almost a return to 53% in just a few weeks. Besides, the trade was fairly justified even in terms of risk. InfoEdge being a holding company was already quite diversified. It already owned, had other popular and giant businesses of India like Nokri.com, Jeevansati.com and Shiksha.com to name a few. The company had more than a decent past record, a trusted management and almost zero debt on its balance sheet. Hardly was there any reason to not make this bet and with time it all succeeded. Now when I am writing this chapter in April 2021, the stock of InfoEdge is trading at 4,500 rupees per share after scaling its high of 6,000 rupees in past three months. Today, the stock seems to be consolidated and has corrected enough. Zomato, by this time, is still yet to finalize the dates of IPO, but valuation-wise, it has almost doubled since then. From 3 billion in September 2020, Zomato in February 2021 got itself valued at 5 billion US dollars, which is a great journey and perhaps a record in itself. The IPOs of Policy Bazaar and Zomato both are still yet to come and so even at 4,500 rupees, InfoEdge seems a fairly valued deal. They still have a long way to go in terms of valuation as long as both unicorns remain unlisted. This is what I call a typical example of valuation multibaggers. Valuation multibaggers are the companies which generally have a holding in one or more private companies which gives us an opportunity to find disparity in their valuations and if it appears that an unlisted entity has greater value which is not reflected in the valuation of the listing company which you feel with time shall correct itself then you my friend have found a valuation multibagger the greatest investor of our times warren buffett often talks about the intrinsic value of his holding company berkshire hathaway and how he prefers its stock to trade around its intrinsic value. He performs open market operations in order to maintain this equilibrium by carrying out buybacks of his own company. 
As we all know, he never buys a stock above intrinsic value, which then points us to a conclusion that he very well knows and understands the value of each of the holdings of Berkshire and then he initiates a buyback. This is exactly what we did in the case of InfoEdge. We knew the market had failed to rightly value InfoEdge based on the investments it had, which gave us a chance to buy more. Therefore, in order to recognize and understand this kind of disparity, one needs lots of data and valuation figures to reach a conclusion. It was easier to do so in the case of InfoEdge because the valuation numbers of its holdings were already out and then you just needed simple arithmetic, but sometimes things are complicated and you might even have to start from scratch. For example, Berkshire of Warren Buffett is a huge holding company, one of the giants of American businesses, which holds the other giants of America. Therefore, determining our sort of valuation disparity on stocks like Berkshire wouldn't be easier for individuals like you and me. We would fail due to various reasons like lack of enough information, lack of skill, inexperience, negligence and so on. Hence, it is better to stick with things we know and the businesses which we can scale and understand. There are only a handful of right ways to carry out a valuation, but a thousand ways to mess it all up. So I would again state that this method of multibaggers should be followed with people who have a strong experience and a greater risk appetite. Always remember, risk and return are brothers. They go often together. Diversify if you are not sure, but go all in when things seem 100% in your hand. There are abundant opportunities in the market, so it is better that you know all the strategies. When the time seems ripe, swing your net and the multibaggers will all be fished. So the most important thing is to keep looking for opportunities. Some day or other, it sure will pass through your window. Just don't stop looking. There was also a stock named Elsid Investment, which had a book value of around 14 to 15k rupees, but the stock seemed to trade only at 15 to 18 rupees per share, but hardly you could have a successful trade. The stock of Elsid was trading so because maybe some shareholders were unaware of its potential value and were selling at the price of market. Elsid was a holding company and it had lakhs of shares of another renowned company, Asian Paints which shows that sometimes retail investors get fooled by the prices determined by the market and fail to recognize the value of the gems they hold. This ignorance often turns beneficial to those who know and you could see 5 to 10 stocks of Elsid exchange hands at the price of peanuts, which should actually have been in thousands or even lakhs. But then it started to come in news and social media, which spoiled the party and the stock of Elsid rarely got traded as many shareholders realized its value and were unwilling to sell it at all costs. So sometimes you have such a clear opportunity, but people on the opposite side are also smarter and you can't take any benefit from it. In such cases, all you have to do is keep trying and move on to the next best options. Cases of Maha Scooters Bajaj Holdings, etc. are all that have the potential to fall in this category. Since they all make a private investment and their stocks could someday show disparity in the actual valuation of their portfolio. Companies like banks, AMCs and insurance also tend to fall in this category because they all have a cash surplus and also a significant stake in other businesses, which at times gives us a chance to recognize a valuation disparity. Sometimes they own stocks, bonds, real estate, which seem undervalued on the paper, but in reality they might have a greater value than what is shown. So if you gather verifiable information from reliable sources and feel that the stock trading values more due to assets underlying it, then you have a valuation multibagger. Now, normally this valuation disparity doesn't last longer than a month or at most than a year. We, in today's world, have many screeners and algos which are too good when finding numerically undervalued stocks, which is often called as stock trading below book value or net book value. Actually, the cases of finding disparity based on book value or net book value will be rare and if ever you do, then most of the time it won't be as fruitful as you think. 
because not all stocks trading below book value or net book value are multibaggers. Often there is a reason why it is trading below book value. Hence, it is not a magic formula, which is why I title this chapter as valuation multibaggers and not below book value multibaggers. By various examples and cases, you probably might have understood what valuation means. I would rather not put up a definition of it because I want you to be free in your approach. Understand the concept rather than by hearting the definition. Following are the things to remember when dealing with potential valuation multibaggers. Number one, it only works with companies which are listed and have listed slash unlisted companies as subsidiaries, holdings or stakes, whichever word you prefer. Number two, before getting into trade, be sure of the valuation disparity you have discovered and be willing to face the consequences which might arise due to miscalculation. Number three, have an incline towards companies and businesses that you understand and those which are smaller in size to increase the probability of your calculations being right. Number four, determine the time frame and target at which you are willing to enter and exit during your strategy. Number five, sometimes situations may be such that the time frame may increase and the stock on which you started as a valuation multibagger may have a possibility of being an evergreen multibagger. Number six, maintain secrecy of these kinds of transactions if your bet amount is high, since any leakage of information may alert the market of the disparity and the stock may start correcting itself even before you enter the trade. With our five important tips on valuation multibaggers, I shall like to end this chapter. Keep reading. We have many strategic multibaggers yet to come and there is lots to learn. Till then, take a break. Share what you have learned with someone you think will be interested and might care. This will help you to understand the concept, which is a deeper and better way of remembering things. Chapter 7. The Sure Shot Multibaggers Quote, We cannot all be rich, as the supply of wealth is limited in the economy. But we can all be wise, as the supply of wisdom is abundant in libraries. Unquote. By Kalpesh Suryavanshi. Let me now introduce you to a new and most valuable genre of multibaggers, the Sure Shot Multibaggers, as we shall call them. These, from the name you can conclude, are the kinds which have the least amount of risk associated with them and the possibility of them being a multi-baggers is also close to 99% if not 100%. Now, there are two kinds of these sure shot multi-baggers based on their time frames which are as follows. Number 1. Short-termed sure shot multi-baggers. Number 2. Long-term sure shot multi-baggers. We shall start our discussion with the first kind of sure shot multibaggers since it alone acts as a seed which gives birth to the second kind of sure shot multibaggers. Normally, the short term sure shot multibaggers are the IPOs, the companies which create a buzz in the primary market, companies which have made big as startups, companies which are often referred to as the most awaited IPOs. Companies we have always been fond of and now via IPO, they give us a chance to partner up in their journey. These companies are not dependent on the market for its IPO, but instead the market is dependent on this company and its IPO. One can expect more than a decent return from the listing gains of these companies. Historically, these companies have almost always given more than 100% listing gains to its IPO investors and often the stock doubles or even triples within a year of the company's listing in the secondary market. So, how does one know that the company which is about to list on the exchange is a sure shot multibagger? Following will the signs. Number 1. Market buzz. As said in the earlier paragraphs, the company shall create a buzz. The news channels, social medias, blogs, all will be filled with enthusiasm. 80% or more of your broking houses will give you a buy rating on the stock. The market speculators will project this opportunity as a once-in-a-lifetime chance and even the people unwary of the market will be interested in this IPO. Number 2. Grey Market Premium 
On the internet, there are various websites which track the background dealings of these stocks. So often, these kind of stocks will trade at more than 50% of their offer price. Note, GMP is not always reliable and is not the only parameter to base your decision upon. Number 3. Renowned Management or Product the short-term sure-shot multi-bagger most often, if not always, will have a renowned management. Could be its CEO, chairman or even a board member. Along with management, another sign would be the popularity of the company's product or the service. The company will have a strong presence, not always internationally, but at least locally. Number 4. Rosy Future the DRHP of the company will be filled with statements which shall paint a rosy picture of the future. The document will fill you with high hopes and will try to strengthen your confidence as an investor by showing its strong past record. Also, the main objective of the filling will be expansion or updation of existing methodology used by the company. Number 5. Expensive Valuation Imagine you have this great company which has a strong presence and loyal customer base. Why on earth would you price its IPO cheaply when you could get a higher and better amount? So when I say expensive valuation, then by normal IPO standards, the IPO of this company shall appear to be expensive whether you compare it with previous IPOs or even with its listed peers. So, the 20% analysts which said avoid for this IPO will often say so based on the expensivity of the IPO. But if the market sentiments seem favorable and more than one of the above conditions are fulfilled, then chances are that you have found a short-term sure shot. Let us now cast our attention to the second category, long-term sure shot multibagger. You see, not all sure shot short term multibaggers are sure shot long term multibaggers, but all sure shot long term multibaggers are also sure shot short term multibaggers. Let me tell you why this is so. Now, when we discuss sure shot short term multibaggers, then we see various reasons for it. These reasons are a guarantee to generate returns for short term, but to keep winning the strike for a longer period. One needs more than the market buzz or renowned management. To be a long-term winner, the company needs more than a strong past record and more than the rosy picture of its future. To be a sure shot, short-term multibagger, you only need words that inspire and the market will follow. But to be a sure shot, long-term multibagger, you need actions that aspire, numbers that prove your credibility. Therefore, do not get mistaken that the signs of sure shot, short term multibaggers are that of long term. They are not. Some, of course, are the signs which will converge for both the categories, but not all. So, then, what and how is the sure shot, long term multibagger? It will have a strong market share, sharper competitive edge over its peers, and the most favorable case is that it will be a monopoly. This kind of company will have the country's economic factors in its favor and sometimes even political. But the problem with favorable political factors is that they do not remain so all the time. Therefore, economic factors in this case have a higher weightage. These are the companies which will grow not alone but with its investors, management, consumer and the whole country. That is, they will contribute in all aspects towards society and will aim to make our lives easier. In order to achieve this, they sometimes might even destroy their peers. They may set a new trend and force the market to adapt according to the conditions they have created. P.S. At this point, perhaps you are thinking that the description of sure shot long term multibaggers almost seems like that of the evergreen multibaggers, and I'm glad that you noticed that. Throughout our study, there will come instances where you'll find this kind of similarity because some multibaggers have more than one characteristics. Some evergreen multibaggers would be sure shot and some sure shot would be evergreens. Some may be valuation as well as sure shots and some evergreens as well as valuation. They will be combinations of one or more depending on the time frame at which you are looking. Take an example. DMART is a stock which is both evergreen as well as sure shot multibagger. During its IPO period, it more than tripled the investor's wealth within just one year of its listing. 
Therefore, it also is a short-termed sure shot multi-bagger. Even today, at the market capitalization of 2 lakh crore, when most analysts are terming it as expensive just because its PE is 200, I state it is as undervalued as it has a long way to go. There is nothing stopping DMART. The economy, the pandemic have all tried to harm its foundation, but India's middle class and the small towners still stop by DMART to shop for its groceries and shall continue doing so perhaps even till 2030. But there also is a significant difference between evergreen multibagger and sure shot long term multibagger. Evergreen multibagger has a time frame greater than five years. That is, when you call a stock as evergreen, then you expect it to be multibagger for at least five years or more. But when you call a stock a long term sure shot multibagger, then you have to define what long means. It could be more than a year, two years three years or five years and the moment it becomes greater than five years then the sure shot long term multibagger also becomes evergreen multibagger. We have businesses which we know shall be multibaggers in the next two or three years. We can see their growth. Such then we call sure shot long term multibaggers. But when we see and know that a stock can grow more than five years and shall keep rewarding its shareholders consistently then we call it as evergreen. Hope now you can differentiate between the long-term sure shot multibaggers and that of evergreen multibaggers. Another example I have about sure shot long-term multibaggers is our government company IRCTC, Indian Railway Catering and Tourism Corporation. Why did I quote this example in a sure shot instead of evergreen? Reason is the nature of this company. With the recent buzz about PSUs and the anticipation of divestment in PSUs, it becomes difficult to envision anything beyond three years related to PSUs. We don't know which government will be upcoming and what role it will play in the management of PSUs and so all these factors combined make the future blur for these kinds of companies and stating evergreen for IRCTC would seem too far-fetched. But by the nature of its current business and the customer base, we can conclude that the next three years of this company are bright. Trains are the lifeline of our country. We have the largest railway system in Asia and a greater part of Indians travel daily by Indian railways. On top of all this, IRCTC is the sole dealer of the ticketing business of this India's giant railway line. The rise of the internet and the facility of mobile banking has made it easier to book tickets for passengers from anywhere, anytime. Also, the desire of Indians to travel, which is repressed in the pandemic, will take over once all this gets over. This shall then bring a boom in the travel industry, whose greatest beneficiary will be IRCTC. As you can see then, it is easy to find a sure shot multibagger using common sense alone. All you need is a right set of mind and an eye for the future. In case of long-term sure shot multibagger, you should have a time frame fixed for which you have an objective in mind and then hold for the set period as long as things seem favorable. Do not feel shy to back off when things are going unplanned. There is always that 1% chance of failure which can erode the 99% possibility of having a sure shot. Summary points of investing in long-term multibaggers. Find a company which has a competitive edge or has a monopoly. Set an objective, a reason why you think it will be a sure shot. Supervise things, re-evaluate the risk, try to support your objectives with the numbers, keep the trajectory realistic. Buy, hold and be patient. Do not get swayed away by the constant chatter of the so-called market gurus. Exit once the goal is achieved. If you think your sure shot has the potential to be evergreen, then go to chapter 2 of Evergreens. Recheck your assumptions and take the next step as seems fit. Chapter 8 The Potential Multibaggers Quote Men of repute are nothing but the slaves of opinions. Unquote By Kalpesh Suryavanshi We all are filled with potential. Potential to be successful and achieve greatness. So is everything around. The sea, the wind, the trees are all potentials waiting to be tapped. Look up in the sky. What do you see? Our sun. It has a potential, potential of solar energy. 
Look at the sea and its mighty wave. What do they have? A potential of tidal energy. Even a dead rock at the feet of a mountain has a potential. It could be turned into a beautiful idol of God or as a building block to build a new house or a tool. Nothing in this world is waste if you know and recognize its potential. Even our dead bodies are brought to some use by our environment, by our nature. Such is also the case with our potential multibaggers. These are the companies which create a new demand or tap on the existing demand which is available in the market. These are the companies which see a potential which everybody else has failed to see and they try to capitalize on this potential. It could be a product, service, certain technology or a new invention. So in a way, there are the initial creators and they often get an advantage of an early entrant. Sometimes the potential they are tapping becomes a quick hit and sometimes it takes years for them to achieve their full strength. So the phase between their creation and greatness is what we call the phase of potential and it is this time where we have to recognize them and try to buy them. Now instead of telling you its descriptions, I shall try to lead with an example. The example I'm using here is a depository company CDSL, Central Depository Services India Limited. The company went public in the year 2017 at a price of 145 to 149 rupees per share. This is still a phase where Jio was new and the telecom industry was undergoing a transformation. The reason I'm stating Jio is that Jio alone has helped a lot to boost this company and several others which can be accessed via internet. Jio brought cheap and quality internet to the majority of Indians which even helped Google, YouTube and Netflix in India. Now CDSL acts like a bank or vault where you can store or safeguard your stocks. For this CDSL charges you a certain fee. Along with this CDSL has various other revenue lines which are all linked to the stock market. Major advantage CDSL had was that of its market share which was around 70% and the rest was taken over by its only peer NSDL. Besides, CDSL has a tie-up with many discount broking firms, one of which was Zeroda. This was a time when not many people were aware about the stock market and anyone trading in the market was termed as gambler for which we have a refined word today as speculator. Nobody that time knew that a few years later, a pandemic was yet to strike and people with money who were forced to sit at home would flock to the market to earn quick bucks. But something was there. You could tell that the cheap internet by Jio was about to revolutionize many industries. Anyone having an account with Zeroda could see how the company was growing and how many discount broking firms were arising. The rise of discount broking alone was a sign that CDSL was growing because almost all of them enrolled their clients' accounts with CDSL. The millennials had and still have a greater risk appetite and are willing to stake it for a higher reward. If not in 2017, you had still three years till 2020 to see that CDSL was tapping a potential and the potential was the biggest bet in India's investing history. From 149 to current 600 plus in 2021, the company has turned out as four baggers. Does that mean we have missed the ride? Not yet. I would say the party has just begun. CDSL has reported that it has crossed 3 crore DMAT accounts mark, which I feel is still a small number compared to the great Indian population and the percentage of youth which resides here since they are potentials in this case. Why only 3 crore and not 10 crore? Why only 10 crore and not 20 crore or 30 crore? We still have less than 4% of Indian population investing in equities, which is a low number compared to other developed countries. Also, the rise of cheap and quality internet has made it quite easier to start, create accounts and carry out trades. It is all available at our fingertips and the cinema, our social media are all acting as catalysts which are boosting people's confidence in the market. So even at 600 or 700, CDSL has a long way to go since it has lots of potential waiting to be tapped. Therefore, the company which is able to successfully tap on this kind of potential is what I call as potential multibaggers. IEX, 
in brackets indian energy exchange bracket closed again is one of the potential multibaggers there was once a time when contracts of energy be it gas or electricity were carried out physically on a long term basis which sometimes resulted in huge loss to either party since the contract was binding and also there was no better option IEX saw this potential and revolutionized this whole scenario by allowing even short term contracts for electricity to be traded which attracted both electricity distributors as well as manufacturers it granted them a safer efficient way to carry out their transactions with time iex became a marketplace of buyers and sellers both searching for better price discovery and cheaper deals Similar are the businesses of Amazon e-commerce as well as OLX India. Both function like exchanges except that IEX was dealing with a different commodity that is electricity. As the time progressed, they also launched a new gas exchange in brackets IGX. So in a way, the company is diversifying, looking for alternate sources of revenue. and on top of it they have a clean balance sheet with zero debt and a market share greater than 90% has only one competitor which still is growing and currently does not possess any threat so in the market you'll see many companies which are either creating a new potential or tapping on a new potential and if you as an investor feel that what they are tapping will be big and is worth it then it's time that you join their party and buy its shares on paper and in hindsight this all seems crystal clear and quite easy to do but it takes lots of research and patience when you practice this in reality cdsl took more than 3 years to be a truly multibagger and to really tap into the potential perhaps it still has a long way to go iex as well took a similar period till then both the stocks had their ups and downs which could test your conviction and your patience Also both companies have various business models and different potential sources one is mining silver while the other is mining gold both have different reserves and both will have different growth stories you see that's the thing with potential multibaggers they have various potentials some take less time some more some last longer while some just take a while For example, CDSL still has lots to tap because its potential is the whole Indian population, whereas IEX has limited corporate clients and limited electricity distributors slash manufacturers willing to participate on its exchange. As the population of India will keep growing, CDSL will always have a void to fill, whereas electricity manufacturing and distributing companies will always have a limit, a ceiling. Therefore it is more important for IEX to find alternative revenue sources than it is for CDSL. The peak period. Unlike evergreen multibaggers, the potential multibaggers have a peak phase which is limited. It could be for a year, 2 or even 5 years. If it has a peak phase greater than 5 years, then according to the definition it will be termed as evergreen and not potential only. perhaps cdsl could be of that kind which will be an evergreen potential multibagger we don't know only time will tell so the peak period as i call it is the phase where the company captures a significant amount of potential that is available in the market like the phase from 2020 to 2022 will be the peak phase of iex in which it will try to capture a great number of clients will report more than decent numbers and show an above average growth thus when the company performs exceptionally the kind of performance which we haven't seen in its past and might not even expect to see in the future is what i call the peak period Note that some companies have a longer peak period while some are shorter. Now the question is what to do after the peak period. After the peak period the stock or the company will start reporting average numbers and a mediocre growth. If the company then fails to recapitalize or fails to identify new potential then it will reach a saturation point and the best thing for you to do will be to exit the business. but all this timing and management can all be done only when you know enough about the company and its business therefore i repeat it again invest only in the businesses that you thoroughly understand
you should be able to identify these patterns and recognize their signs only then can you bag the potential multibaggers key things to note when investing in potential multibaggers number 1 know the competition you see potential multibaggers are those which are tapping a potential like a farmer sowing seeds in his farm now if more than 10 farmers start sowing that small piece of land and expect fruits then it won't be enough the competition will rise and the profits narrow lesser the competition better is the share gained out of the potential in our cases too cdsl and iex had a duopoly and both had a stronger market share hence they were getting a bigger chunk of that potential whereas companies which tap on a potential with multiple competitors are bound to fail so along with potential they also should have lesser competition only then can it be a multi bagger and sometimes there may come instances where the potential is abundant and infinite then there won't be any need to search for less competition an example of such case would be asteroid mining or space exploration the potential is abundant there no matter how much competition you have we all will always have enough so i hope now you understand when to look for less competition and when not to number 2 profitability profit is like the oxygen of businesses it cannot survive without it in the market there are companies that come up with great ideas ideas to tap potentials but due to poor execution and unrealistic hopes they fail to capitalize it they have a great idea a new vision but their numbers tell a completely different story so if you see a business hoping to tap a potential but in actuality is failing to realize it into profit then it is better to stay away There are businesses today burning cash of billion dollars every year startups being valued on the future revenues alone instead of profits this is a sign of danger they cannot burn cash all life some day their reserves will run out and they'll have to report profit that is the time we want nothing but profit should inspire you to invest what use is a business without profit what use is a job without pay and what use is an investment without interest granted as startups you need capital and some money to burn but if the business fails to deliver profit even after the growth phase of its journey then you have made a wrong choice you're losing an opportunity a chance to invest in other profitable businesses by investing in cash burning startups these are like the baby men who grow physically but not intellectually or financially the company which is dependent on its promoters investors and bondholders for its survival is like a full grown up man who is still dependent on his parental income no that's not a way to run a business neither is it a good idea to invest in such businesses i don't care at what pace your revenues are growing or at what speed your ebitda is multiplying show me the profits and i'll think this should be the mindset of a rational investor So look out for profitability even if it is in the future but don't let it be in the distant future otherwise it will cost you your present opportunities number 3 smart and trustworthy management last but not the least is a team of good managers promoters and board members you see not all kinds of multi baggers really need this criteria to be fulfilled there are some businesses and their models that even an idiot can run those in brackets not literally of course bracket close but companies that are tapping potential need the qualities i described it needs the management as i said and the main reason for this is the debt our previous examples both being potential multi baggers none had debt on its balance sheet but they were lucky and exceptions to do so most potential multi baggers will have or need debt a significant amount of it because they are tapping a potential something which very few have yet discovered so to achieve that goal they are going to need debt in order to fulfill the demand but debt is a two way sword you can use it to cut the throat of your enemies or use it to slit your own vein 
Therefore, a management that is experienced, intelligent and trustful is a necessity when dealing with potential multi-baggers. It should not happen that they ran away without paying the banks, without settling the dues of bondholders, disappointing the shareholders. It would be a nightmare. Protect yourself from such mishappenings. Research about it. Watch their interviews, past records. Read their statements in the annual reports. Be responsible. Chapter 9. Unpopular Multibaggers Quote, Successful investing is about being wrong less often. Unquote. By Kalpesh Suryavanshi. In India, we have around 5,000 plus companies listed on the stock exchange. If you were to study each one of them, it would perhaps take you more than a hundred years. So the heap of potential investment opportunities is so huge. The opportunities are abundant, but in the news, in media, on the internet, we only see a handful of those covered and tracked daily. The companies that make up the news are often those which are either held by institutions, famous investors, mutual funds or the government. And there is a commonality between all the previous entities, that is, they choose companies which are greater in size comparatively. Most often, it would either be a company which has mid-cap or large-cap and rarely will there be a small-cap company. And whenever you see a small-cap company being reported about it in news or media, then it is only after it has made big, it is only after it has turned a multi-bagger. Now, our unpopular multi-baggers are those which fall into the small-cap category, the companies that are doing great, performing better than average, but nobody knows about them, since they are too small for the media to report and too small for AMCs to hold. A retail investor can benefit from them if they are tracked and reported by analysts, but they won't do it because it's not worth their time. Besides, being in the small-cap zone, also makes these companies more riskier and volatile, which news channels and analysts dislike. They want a sale, they want to make a prediction which will work, and so they avoid taking risk and selling advice which involves uncertainty. They are too careful of their reputation. Also, there are certain SEBI and AMFI norms which restrict institutions to engage in such small-sized companies. So, the stocks and companies, even if they are great, go unreported and only a handful of lucky investors succeed to take the advantage. With the contemporary literature on investing, there has been a motion that multi-baggers are only giant companies, the popular and famous companies, but such ain't the case. In reality, the smaller the business, the younger the business, greater are its chances to grow and tremendous is its potential for the future. Hence, the size of the company doesn't matter. We all start from zero and there is no reason to favour only giant businesses just because of their size. Of course, a giant and stable business gives one a sense of security and also a privilege of being part of such a corporation. But if you want to succeed, then you have to take a chance. You have to take some risk. You have to kiss a few ugly frogs until you find your charming prince. I'll tell you an example of an unpopular multi-bagger I had discovered which again is archived as a video on my YouTube channel. The company is RVNL, in brackets, Rail Vikas Nigam Limited, bracket closed. When I made the video, the company had a PE of 7 and the stock price was somewhere near 19 to 20. During the initial panic of the pandemic, the stock had also made a low of Rs 10 per share. So, one had a chance to buy it lower even after the video. Anyway, the company had some extraordinary numbers which could give a complex even to India's giant retailer, DMART. The five-year sales growth of that company was 36% CAGR, whereas DMART had that of 31% CAGR. The profit growth of that company in the five-year period was 17% CAGR, while DMARTS was 44%. Now, here the number may not seem that interesting, but there is a catch. 
Dmart at the time was worth 1.5 lakh crore rupees company and it had a profit of rupees 1300 crore whereas RVNL a company worth only 4000 crore rupees had a profit of 750 crore rupees you see the difference on one hand you have something worth 1.5 lakh and you will get only 1300 rupees whereas on the other hand you pay only 4000 rupees and you get 750 rupees so the deal was worth taking the risk was worth taking besides rvnl had all those numbers consistent rvnl being a government company also had huge orders so in a way even its future earnings were predictable but none at that time in mainstream media covered it only after its journey from 10 to 20 after the pandemic it was in the news even today as i write this chapter the stock is trading at near rupees 25 per share after touching its high of 30 even today the story of that stock seems the same the numbers remain the same and its future still seems as bright as it looked a year ago but because it is a small cap not many will care not many will see you see giant investors and institutions can afford to lose these kind of opportunities because they have a huge pool of capital and a small cap multibagger won't make much difference in their portfolio for example if you have 100 rupees and you invest 1 rupee and even if you double that 1 rupee your portfolio has not grown significantly but by only 1% On the other hand, if you have only 10 rupees and you invest 1 rupee and double it, then your portfolio has grown by 10%. Therefore, as small and retail investors, these small caps, their small opportunities are quite big for us and could even be life-changing for us. Now then, what are the qualities of unpopular multibaggers? There is no difference between a well-known multibagger and an unpopular multibagger. Only difference is that it is small in size, which is why it is unpopular. It does not have Ambani or Damani as promoters, but it has all the qualities which the companies of Ambani and Damani have. It has a decent balance sheet, sometimes manageable debt or even no debt. It will have a great order book if it is in manufacturing. or its product will have a strong local hold it will have a sense of stability in its business and abundance of potential growth but most importantly it will have a record of above average growth in terms of numbers throughout its history remember consistency is the key if you find a business which has all that it takes to be a multibagger but lacks consistency then be sure to avoid it at all costs It is sometimes better to lose an opportunity than to lose the principal amount in hand. Okay, now what are the tools we have to find these kinds of multibaggers? Since they are unpopular, we can't find them in the news or paper. So where should we look for them? Well, as far as my experience is concerned, we sometimes just stumble upon these kinds of stocks on the internet or on blogs. because there is always some guy with the least amount of subscribers who is looking for this kind these are the people like dumpster divers they are searching for gold in garbage and often they do find one so it is essential that you be part of such investment communities either on whatsapp or telegram second is the way of hard work you have to get your hands dirty you have to use screeners Screeners are sites or apps which allow you to search, sort and filter the companies based on the parameters you choose. So if you give an input of less than 5000 market cap, it will show you a list of all companies which have a market cap lower than 5000 crore. There are different ways and various sites which have their own way of doing it. So you need to learn which isn't such a complex task. If you can read and understand what is written in this book, then understanding and learning how to use a screener will also be a cakewalk next question then is what should be the parameters to enter while searching for the unpopular multibagger you see a greater chunk of unpopular multibaggers is found in the small cap category but sometimes 
by chance you can also find those in the category of mid caps so initially you look only in small caps that is below 5000 crore companies because chances of finding it there are high if not you can increase the limit up to 10000 crore market cap look for above average growth sales growth above 20% and profit growth above 15% will do do not set the limitation for pe because the market isn't always fair it will assign expensive pe even to a cheap stock while cheap pe to a valuable stock so don't assign the parameter of pe next try to look out for companies having less or at least a manageable amount of debt when i see manageable the company should have a positive net book value because we are looking at a dangerous section of the market and most companies that fail here are often because of mismanagement of debt if you like dividend you can put it up to 1 to 2% but it is completely optional i would say don't assign this parameter unless you really need it because not all great companies pay dividends also it is better that you find a company which has roe greater than 15% and roce greater than 20% this is just to minimize the risks involved else take your chances if you are experienced lastly as said earlier look for stable and consistent numbers in the past 5 years of its history so is this all enough no there will always be things which will remain unsaid lessons which only experience can teach my work is not to give you a formula because there isn't one there is no way to get rich but many bill gates got rich by selling software steve jobs made big from the hardware bezos has a website while musk has tesla do what you love buy what you understand that alone is a formula the only rule Every day I see many people who are doing things they don't like hoping to be rich one day. I just don't understand. It is common sense. You can see most people who are at the top are there because they did what they loved, not because they hate it. Unlike you, they don't hate waking up in the morning and going to the office. They don't work but play. If you're reading my book just because your friend or relative recommended it, if you think you will get rich reading this, I would say quit quit now read carry on only if you are interested if you like businesses if you want to own a business learn if you want to contribute to society in this way but if money alone is your inspiration then you will fail you see money has a limitation beyond a certain limit money becomes nothing but just another number in your bank account you need something beyond that to keep up the hustle If Bezos, Musk, Gates or Jobs had worked only for money, they would have retired by now. But they seek something beyond money. A passion to achieve something which cannot be bought with money is what keeps them going. I think that's enough of self-help chatter. And now we end our chapter on unpopular multibaggers. I have given all the signs I had about it. Now let your guts and your instinct lead you. and we'll meet in our next chapter chapter 10 comeback multibaggers quote buy low sell high is terrible advice for people who don't understand value unquote by kalpesh suryavanshi Being a businessman or an entrepreneur is one of the most rewarding career options that is out there. To set on an adventure, to start a journey towards the known, the thrill to create something which you can call your own, the peace you get knowing that you are helping thousand to earn their livelihood, the enthusiasm to wake up daily and cause an impact in this world, the sense of leaving a mark in history. all is inexplicable an outwardly experience which no known activity can provide which is why despite of all its risks fears and rejections people are still learning business there is almost nothing in this world which isn't capitalized or have thought of to be capitalized but as we know not all businesses are alike 
not all industries are favorable. There are some industries in which it is quite easier to survive, grow and expand, in brackets, depending on the time period you look at. Bracket closed. For example, today information technology is at its all-time high. From artificial intelligence to blockchain tech, there are numerous options to tap on. But then we also have industries which have proven to be difficult to operate in because there is cutthroat competition or is either capital intensive. Like, airlines have been historically difficult to manage, no matter who you are and no matter how rich you are. Ratan Tata of Air India, G.R. Gopinath of Air Deccan, Vijay Malaya of Kingfisher, all some biggies who failed and failed big running an airline. Of course, they did some other great work, but as far as airline is concerned, they either had to sell it or shut it down permanently. So by nature, you have businesses which will be smooth as a boat in a calm lake and also businesses which will be like a raft in a rough sea. In this chapter then, we'll be going to look at the sinking ships and how with the right leadership, the right captain brought it back on the surface. You see, market loves news. If the news is great, then the stock will climb peaks. If the news is pessimistic in nature, then the stock will tumble down. This way, a good news keeps pushing the stock higher like a rocket while a bad news drags the stock down like a fire in the forest. It is destructive. Hence, the negative sentiments of the market undermine even the great leaderships and almost sink the titanics. Now, your job as an explorer of multibaggers is to find out such places of shipwrecks, the industries where you can find sinking ships. Once you find it, all you have to do is to calculate the chances of its comeback, chances of its revival and estimate the risks involved before entering the transactions. Every day when there is a business succeeding, there are businesses which are failing because of it. Once gain is somebody else's loss. It is all about survival and acquiring a strong market share. For example, the initial phases of GEO, that is 2015, and its popular phase, where we saw a spike in its user base, in brackets, 2017, were devastating times for all the other telecom companies. Uninor, Tata, Idea, Vodafone and Airtel suffered huge losses and had to take a substantial amount of debt to survive. They all were like giant ships sinking in the ocean of telecom industry, all because of a new competitor. But there was a hero who had the strength to fight back, who had the capacity to give tit for tat, but under the pessimism, his powers were undermined and confidence shaken. The hero I am talking about is none other than Airtel. From December 2017 to October 2018, the stock of Airtel fell by almost 40%, making a low of Rs. 266 per share. But now, as I write about it, the stock has doubled and has crossed the range of 500 per share. On the other hand, its contemporaries, Idea and Vodafone, have merged together to fight the common enemy, but are trading at their all-time lows due to overburden of debt and the loss of users. In India, and I guess even throughout the world, we have a trend of dual SIM card mobiles. So one knew that Jio had already reserved its one slot in the mobiles of majority by its extraordinary service and prices. So the competition was not actually against Jio, but within themselves. Other telecom companies had to fight each other for that other slot in our mobile phones. Like if a tiger starts chasing you and your friends, then you don't have to run faster than the tiger, but just fast enough than your friends. One who leaves behind will be the prey. Similar was the case with Airtel, and one could see with common sense alone that Airtel had a greater speed and reach than Idea, Vodafone, both combined. Airtel already was giving a heads-to-head -head competition to Jio via its offers. You could even see it in its advertisements. By March 2017, Idea had already started struggling and had reported a loss of negative 400 crore and in 2018, it had the loss of negative 4,168 crores 
whereas Airtel was still profitable in 2017 at 3,800 crore rupees, which fell down to 1,099 crore in 2018. So, the numbers were comparatively better in the case of Airtel than that of others. Now, I understand that it still was a risky deal at that time, knowing the dominance of Jio. But if we put Jio outside the picture and think of it only as a battle for the second slot, then the answer was clear. Airtel surely was its sole holder. That was a great comeback, I would say, which gave us a case study of our comeback multibagger. Today, both the companies, Idea Vodafone and Airtel, have a huge amount of debt and their profits have narrowed, but still Airtel alone has a better chance of freeing itself from the clutches of debt than that of Idea Vodafone. The best thing about the comeback multibaggers is that you don't have to hold them forever. You just have to fish them when they are weak and leave when they have their strength back. The moment of their comeback is the moment to leave. It is a completely different matter if you think that their future is still bright and could be evergreen multibaggers. It shall depend on the case and the opportunities which you already have in hand. So, the right thing would be to leave and explore the better opportunity, instead of sticking down, hoping the healthy to be healthier. There is a company which is close to my heart because it is a company that belongs to my hometown, Jalgaon, Maharashtra, and I have seen it grow since my childhood. The company is actually over-diversified and its major problem is its inability to reduce its debt and churn new profits. It is a company which is built on the pillars of debt and any time it could collapse. Now, there are some of its businesses, like its agriculture division, which gives me hope. If the company intelligently gets rid of its non-performing businesses and if it focuses on its core business alone, its strength alone, then it could reach the stage of, as we call it, the monopoly. But its management doesn't seem to have a strong vision and no guided plan since they're trying to run it as a family business. They have a mighty ship but a poor captain. In future, if they ever realize their mistake, then we would have another potential comeback multibagger in our work. The company I am referring to here is Jane Irrigation Limited. So let time be the judge. Now, just like we have Bermuda Triangle, a geographical location where most ships and flights seem to go missing, so do we have industries where businesses seem to struggle. This is the place where you can search for the comeback multibaggers. As said earlier, airline is one of those industries. Telecom, banks, broking firms, electric appliances, motor and car industry, real estate and paints etc. are some of those industries. The reason for these industries being in this list is the nature of their business. Some are capital intensive. Some have cutthroat competition. Some have a limited market share. Some need constant updation of technology which require greater working capital and some have all of the above. So the difficulties in operating these businesses is so huge that no one company ever rules the whole industry. They are like crabs, pulling each other down and not letting anyone reach the top. But no matter how tough the times are, there will always be a hero who will make a comeback and that will be a multibagger. Unlike movies, the heroism won't last permanently and so we also won't be holding the stock forever. Along with the industries, there are also situations where you can find your comeback multibagger. For example, when there is a financial crisis, banks are the ones who suffer a greater blow. Scams, frauds and rise in NPAs are all common problems of the banks. For example, Punjab National Bank, which is the second national PSU bank after SBI, faced a fraud of rupees 14,000 crore and it is still trying to get out of it. In the private sector, we have Yes Bank, which also faced similar consequences of fraud by Rana Kapoor and is trading now at an all-time low. If I were to choose between the two, I would say Yes Bank has a better chance of revival than that of Punjab National Bank. Since they are in the private sector, they don't have any limitations as that of PSUs. Besides, from the previous few quarters, their numbers are seeing a recovery. Also, in these kind of cases, one needs to have a regular update about the firm's steps 
which are being taken by them to revitalize their business. One also needs some knowledge or understanding about the cases pending in the court and only then can we surely say what's up next. The best time to buy these firms is not when they are at the lows, but at the stage where it shows some signs of recovery. Like, if a landmark judgment is made about the case, the borrowings seem to have gone down by at least 50% or when the percentage of NPAs is lowered from the peak. You see, not all heroes fight the enemy with bare hands. Some use a gun, grenade, call the police or just let him suffer. Similarly, not all comeback multibaggers will use the same strategy. They'll all improvise. So for me to give you precise signs of their revival becomes difficult. As I said earlier, sometimes you'll just have to trust your own instincts. Airtel had a different strategy. Yes Bank might employ a different strategy. So wait for the surprises. Wait for the mysteries to unfold. Sometimes it is even okay to fail buying the comeback multibagger because witnessing its journey of revival alone is astounding. It's okay. Sometimes you'll miss opportunities which are at the tip of your nose. We all do that. But what is important is to keep learning and keep growing. Let me now tell you a few things before you invest in comeback multibaggers. Number 1. Calculate the risk. The comeback multibaggers are the riskiest of all multibaggers in this book. Unless you are 100% sure, which you cannot be since these are not sure shots, allocate only 5% or less percentage of your portfolio to these. Number 2. Determine your holding period. Often there are cases which last longer than 5 years because the problem is so big. Therefore, only when you think that the dark phase won't last for more than 2-3 to three years, only then should you invest here. If it seems longer than 3 years, then it is not worth the time because you are losing other opportunities for that. Number 3. Look out for cash surplus. In such situations, cash alone is the king. So if you see some company struggling, but it has a good amount of liquid assets, enough to keep running the business smoothly for at least next 3 years, then you may not need to worry much. Look out for assets which the company can sell and recover its losses. See if the management is really willing and putting efforts to revive the business. For that, you need to attend the investors' meet and other conferences held by the company. Another best option in order to minimize the risk would be to invest only when the company has a positive net book value. Now that you know and are equipped with sufficient knowledge about the comeback multibaggers, dive in and search for some which you think would make you money. Be their partner in the journey of revival. If not, at least see a company which is struggling and write things which you think, if done, can help the company to make a comeback. Just witness what is happening and see if your predictions are coming true. With time, you will develop confidence and just with a glance at their balance sheet, you could tell if the company has chances to make a comeback or not. Share your notes with your friends. Try to make a case study and ask for inputs from your friends or your teachers. This will not only be helpful for you as an investor, but as a businessman or a business consultant. You can start your own business and you can use this knowledge to face and solve your own problems. The chapter is all about finding problems in the company and coming up with solutions to help it make a comeback. If you can't be a businessman or an entrepreneur, then at least learn to think like one. It is a skill helpful for us all because we all at some point in our life struggle. Struggle to make a living. Struggle to make an impact. And knowing all these stories, knowing that people have overcome the worst, gives us hope and fills us with self-confidence. Whether you are managing a business, your career or your family, all this has wide applications and in all aspects of your life. It teaches you to never give up, no matter how strong your enemy is. We all have to fight. And the moment you win the wars in your head, you need not win against any outside. Chapter 11 Merger Slash Acquisition Multibaggers Quote Your body is what you eat and your thoughts are what you read. Unquote by Kalpesh Suryavanshi 
In 1965, Warren Buffett, the world's greatest investor, purchased a 100% stake in a company called Berkshire Hathaway for $8.3 million. It was a struggling company which Warren had bought to turn it round for a comeback, but during that phase, it was turning out to be his biggest mistake. But today in 2021, his biggest mistake is also his greatest achievement. Berkshire is one of the most valuable businesses in the American history. The company has a market cap of more than $500 billion, which is an extraordinary journey. It is the best possible example of a merger-slash-acquisition multibagger. But we aren't always that lucky and such miracles rarely do occur in the financial world. Most common example of M&A will not last longer than three years. Merger and acquisition multibaggers occur when two giants come together and form a union or when one giant takes over another dwarf business, in which case the dwarf turns out to be a multibagger. Whenever a big business acquires a small business, then the shareholders of that small business are greatly benefited, which is in a way a sure shot. But when two giants come together, that isn't always a great sign. For example, we saw the case of Idea Vodafone. So it will depend on the circumstances and reasons for which the process of merger and acquisition is taking place. Not every M&A is going to be a multibagger. There should be a substantial reason for it. In India, we have an example of a company called Ruchi Soya, the company that sold soy food brand Nutrella. But due to misadministration, the company had become insolvent and its proceeding was pending in NCLT. In 2019, Patanjali, a company renowned for its Ayurveda products, came as a rescuer to the sinking business of Ruji Soya. Patanjali won the bid and acquired the company for Rs 4,350 crore and successfully merged it in the Patanjali group. Since its relisting, the stock of Ruji Soya rose up to 3,000% in just a few months. Similar story was seen when Mukesh Ambani's Reliance Industries won the bid of an insolvent company called Alok Industries for Rs 5,050 crore. Since then, the stock gave a return of 900% in just four months. Now, most of the time, this really isn't justified when you term it in terms of valuations. They are too pricey and also may not be valuable. But that's what M&A multibaggers are supposed to be. They aren't value deals, but a sale of euphoria. You have to stick in as long as the euphoria continues and try to sell just when it starts falling down the peak. There are various reasons when companies decide to merge or acquire each other, and so not all decisions are soothing. Sometimes the news of acquisition or merger is enough to spike up the stock. Some acquisitions are just ways to save taxes or to find a backdoor to SEBI norms. Their games are big and we as retail investors can't help but only wonder. So I wouldn't say that it is a good idea to go all in when investing in these kind of multibaggers. These are simply gambles and can't even be termed as an investment. Since most trades in M&A multibaggers will require you to get out within six months. It would then depend upon the risks you want to take and the money you want to bet on the speculative kind of multibagger. Chapter 12. Rumored Multibaggers Quote, People are so excited about return on investment that they forget about return of investment. Unquote by Kalpesh Suryavanshi Adjoining the M&A multibaggers are the rumored multibaggers. Often, the news of mergers, acquisitions, leaked internal deals turn out to be false, baseless rumours and even the top finance channels start forwarding that rumour to the general public because the news, whether true or not, has spice. It sells and gets them TRP. When the rumour is positive, then the people with long get the benefit. And when the rumour, as most rumours are, negative, then the people with short get the benefit. Now, most often, this craze doesn't last longer than a week because the management has the responsibility to come out and clear the fog. So things do get settled, 
but till then the stock has either made a new high or has made new lows depending on the circumstances and the nature of the rumor i know there are two kinds of people reading my book one who want to play safe even if it takes them too long to establish themselves and others who want to make big and quick even if it makes them risk their principal and the second kind people with greater risk appetite should choose these kind of multi baggers if you want to play safe you can skip this chapter altogether let me now tell you the nature of rumors and the right way to take advantage of these cases firstly if it is a big news which is too good to believe chances are that it isn't really worth believing if the news is so great that it has reached you via popular circulars like news channels blogs whatsapp or telegram then it has so because they wanted it to reach you there are people in the market who fabricate these rumors for their own advantage it could be insiders management operators and sometimes even the news anchors they have the power and capacity to manipulate the market with their opinions and they divert your attention towards the things they want you to see and believe such an incident happened on may 28 There was news stating Google was to acquire a stake in the struggling Idea Vodafone company. It was a time when Facebook of America had already acquired a stake in Mukesh Ambani's Jio platforms. So the time was ripe and there was an air that American businesses could perhaps be really interested in the Indian businesses. It was an era where the slogans of Make in India were trending on social media. So the news spread like a fire in the forest and people started buying the stock of Idea Vodafone hoping a bright light at the end of the tunnel. The stock hit two upper circuits that same day and closed about 25%. Next day on May 29th a clarification was issued by the management that the news of Google acquiring stake in Idea Vodafone was untrue. But the damage was already done. and the stock of idea vodafone rose up to 150% in that week itself despite the clarification given by the management so these things do hurt cause a lot of damage but if one has learned the timing which you should have in order to be a trader then you can benefit from these rumors also there is no end to this every day there is a news which is untrue a promise which goes unfulfilled but if you want to rule then Just get your heart stoned and see the world burn in fire while you stand tall in the balcony of your castle. Let me now give you a few tips for trading in rumored multibagger. Number 1, inspect the nature of rumor. As a trader, we don't have to care about the news being true or untrue. We just need to know the impact it can cause. Is it positive or negative? Will it take the stock up or down? determine the intensity if the news is true or false how much up or down can it drag the stock 10% 20% or 50% make a guess an educated guess some news have the potential to take a stock to its all time high or at all time low so it's a huge chance for you if your guess or the estimate comes true number 2 Find out the trading route. If it is a stock that falls in the category of future and options, then choose options over future. Options are way better when taking up uncertainty and a deal which involves a limited time frame. Since most rumors get cleared within a week, look out for weekly call or put depending on the impact of rumor. Do not buy a call or put which is too close to the current price because it will require you to risk a greater amount instead buy according to the previous guess you had made if you think the news can take the stock higher by 25% then set the target price which is greater than 25% of that of the stock price this way it will take you less money and the potential profit will remain good if not great do same for shorts number 3 buy the stock if if the stock doesn't have derivatives to trade then you can take chances by buying the stock if you think you can hold the stock if things go sideways then buy it with your principal but this option of trading with cash alone might restrict you 
the quantity which you may want won't be available if the volume is too low. Illiquidity might be a problem. Number four, know the taxes and charges. Today, most people prefer discount brokers, so this isn't a problem for them. But sometimes it is essential to know what excess charges it will cost you to make that deal, because it might narrow your profit down, which may not be worth the risk. Number five, round up. Be sure to set a stop loss and a target, no matter what. A successful trader comes in the market with an expectation to lose. He has an amount aside which he is willing to risk, and this mindset allows him to take a greater risk. Under any circumstances, set a stop loss and the target, which will execute the trade or complete the trade by itself if it hits the price specified. I guess above information was sufficient for you to deal with the rumored multibaggers. See you then in our next chapter. Chapter thirteen: Demand Supply Multibaggers. Quote. Average hates the idea of investing because it requires patience. Trading seems enticing because it presents itself as a get-rich-quick strategy. Unquote by Kalpesh Suryavanshi. Hey reader, do you know about the tulip crisis? If not, let me tell you about it in brief. It was during the time when the Europeans had led on a spree of earth exploration and exploitation of weaker nations through trade or by colonizing them in the name of religion. It was the time when the demand for anything outside Europe was termed as exotic and a luxury. Such was also the case with the flower tulip, which at that time, due to a certain virus, broke its bulb and gave the flower an admirable texture. So, the demand of the flower eventually started increasing, so much that there wasn't enough supply. Many farmers and traders thought of benefiting from the demand and started growing the plant. Those who couldn't started speculating in the tulip prices via future contracts. It so happened that by the month of February 1636, the average price of tulip exceeded that of the annual salary of a skilled worker at that time and in some cases the price of one tulip was even greater than the price of a house. But as the time progressed, the prices of tulips fell drastically and the tulip holders went bankrupt overnight. This is what we call the tulip mania, which is one of the first speculative crises recorded in history. Things like these tell us that people are sheeps. They'll do what the majority is doing despite its superficiality. Sometimes people fail to use their common sense and follow the trend even by risking their savings and the future of their family. What we see today, the cryptocurrency bubble, the popularity of Bitcoin is all synonymous to the tulip mania. Actually, the tulip mania was comparatively better because it ended in just a year. But Bitcoin has survived since past 10 years and its price is soaring day by day. As I write this, the price of one Bitcoin equals 43 lakh rupees and there are more than 4,000 other cryptocurrencies in the market. Now, technology-wise, blockchain, the tech on which Bitcoin is based, has many benefits and is here to stay. But Bitcoin as a currency is a hogwash. I also understand that most currencies in the world are fiat, that is, they are based on the command of the government, like promissory notes issued by the government. So they are just papers with an assurance given by the government and the government can print it as much as it wants. But Bitcoin is worse. It has no central reserve to control or regulate its demand and supply. It cannot be tracked and it is mined using computers which consume too much electricity because they are supercomputers and not our PCs. Also, Bitcoin, unlike our currencies of the world, is too volatile. A year ago, it was priced at 20 lakh. 
But I say 20 lakh or 40 lakh for what? A digital currency which isn't backed by the government, which is even made illegal in some countries, which can only be used over the internet, out of which not even 1% of the businesses accept it. And even if you settle on Bitcoin, then what about the rest of the 3,999 cryptocurrencies? Facebook had planned to create its own cryptocurrency. Reliance of India had also planned to make one. And if every corporation starts creating its own currency, then how many wallets will you have? And who will control their volatility? Bitcoin, in my hand, is perhaps worth 40 lakh today and it could go even to 10 lakh tomorrow. There is no one regulating it except that of the demand and supply mechanism. When more people buy, its price rises and when more people sell, its price falls down. So, one moment you could be a Bitcoin billionaire and the next you could be a millionaire without even doing anything. Strange, isn't it? The people, institutions and businesses that promote these cryptocurrencies are the ones who already hold them. They just want to inflate the price and dump that useless asset, in brackets, not even an asset technically, bracket closed, on the ignorance. These will be the people who will suffer like the people did in the tulip crisis. Bitcoin today is truly at a crazy height. The price of one Bitcoin, that is 42 lakh rupees, which is greater than the average flat slash house price in a decent city of India. Why would someone invest in such an asset instead of buying a physical house which they can at least hold even if its price falls down? It will at least produce income via rent. Or you could buy a farm which could produce crops. What does our Bitcoin produce? Nothing. Strange. I know, but people are weird. They don't understand value. They understand the price. Give their clothes a logo and price it 10 times than its actual cost. They'll still buy. Nobody understands quality. That's why things in the market are priced. Anyway, Bitcoin then, according to our definition, is a demand supply multibagger. The demand supply multibagger is an asset which, regardless of its value, grows and multiplies in price just because it is limited in supply and people are crazy enough to buy it. And sometimes it is better to be a devil, a wolf among the sheep. It saves you from being crucified. Take advantage of the folly around. Don't lose a chance to make money. In the end, these alone will be the people who will worship you. Take another example. Diamonds are nothing but unbreakable stones. There is nothing precious about them except that they are rare and reflect some light. But the marketing of them was so great that even today, almost all American weddings are incomplete without a ring with diamond in it. People shell out their life savings to buy that stone. Despite their expensiveness and uselessness, people are still buying diamonds. So are the stocks in the market. Similar are the companies in the market. Companies that produce nothing, no revenue, no profit, but they produce enough buzz to attract inexperienced investors and lure them into buying that stock. There are blogs, channels and SMS or texts that promote buying in these stocks, giving you a hope to earn quick bucks and many fall in that trap. Sometimes the promoter holding in those stocks is so high that there is hardly any supply left for the retail investors. And since the supply is low, the people who have those stocks sell them at freakishly high prices. And the buyer of that stock hopes that he too can find some another fool like him to sell at a higher price than what he has bought at. So this chain continues until all realize their mistake and start selling the worthless, which they thought was gold. Orchid Pharma, a stock that got relisted in November 2020, has given a return of more than 10,000% in just past six months. The promoter of the company, Dhanuka Laboratories, 
holds 98% stake in that company and had bought those shares at dirt cheap prices. But the stock got occupied in the cycle of demand and supply and the retail investors started their queue to buy the leftover chunk which caused its prices to rise exceptionally. And when something is in trend, in demand, then people flock on it like crazy without giving any second thought, just like we saw in the tulip mania or the crypto bubble. Valuation-wise, the company does not deserve the price it is trading at. In its latest quarter, December 2020, it had a revenue of 103 crore rupees and a net loss of negative 45 crores. The company also have a debt of 437 crore rupees, which it seems to be paying off from past quarters. So, the current market cap of 6,100 crore rupees isn't justified for it. Whether justified or not, we as explorers of multibaggers have to keep searching for such deals. Like an archaeologist who finds a needle older than 1,000 years, no matter how useless it seems to you, there will always be an idiot willing to buy it as an antique or rare masterpiece. So you should look for deals which are rare, stocks which have lesser trading volume, companies which have high promoter holding and public holding less than 5%. These create a bubble. This low supply may one day start an upward journey in terms of price and then as you see, the momentum can hop on and enjoy the ride. But don't buy unless there is any news or a big name involved because such things act as a fuel to get that stock running. Orchid Pharma, in our case, took over because the pharma sector has been in demand since the start of the pandemic. So the rise in the pharma sector and the rise in the stock of Orchid Pharma had a correlation. This relation of sector and its impact in the individual stocks will be discussed in upcoming chapters. Often, the demand supply multibaggers are the penny stocks which are dirt cheap, trading below rupees 10 per share. These stocks will also have low trading volume and their chart will be linear, either upwards or downwards. But you also have to be careful because often these scripts are manipulated by the operators. Operators are the people who keep trading the stock at a higher price between themselves in order to show volume and lure inexperienced people into the trap. This activity of theirs is also called pump and dump in the stock market slang. Following are the parameters which you can input in the screener and keep a track of potential demand supply multibaggers. Number 1. Keep the market capitalization lower than 1000 crore. Number 2. Limit the current price of the stock below rupees 20 per share. Number 3. Set the promoter holding greater than 90%. Number 4. Or set the public holding equal to or less than 5%. Number 5. This should give you a list of few stocks. Track their price movement weekly, if not daily, and look out for momentum. It could be because of some news announcement from the company, a disclosure, result, or anything similar that seems to be positive. And if the stock starts moving upwards, leaving behind its average range, and if the deliverables in percentage seems growing, then chances are that it is taking off. And once these stocks start a run, then there is no stopping until a few weeks or even months. Number 7. The Exit Strategy I leave it up to you. It is like entering the Chakraview in Mahabharata. There is a way to get in, but getting out of it is quite challenging. The reason again is the illiquidity, depending on how much you have bought and how much out of it you can sell. There is a risk definitely, but so is the reward. Earning 1000% or 10,000% return in a few months ain't a joke. It seems easy in the news, but when you try to earn it, then you will know the difficulty. But I don't want to disappoint you. I told you the ways and I gave you the signs. Let me know how many of you can find and how many of you can actualize. Chapter 14. Superstar Multibaggers Quote, 
companies come and go, but the market remains. Index funds are the way for average investors. Unquote by Kalpesh Suryavanshi. There are people we admire, people we respect, because they have achieved which we would have loved to achieve or that which we dream to achieve. They are our inspirations. They are our heroes, our superstars. We love them and applaud, no matter what they do, and sometimes this deep appreciation turns into a submission. We get blind in their love, out of respect or compassion, whatever you call it. And we are not willing to accept that they can be flawed or make mistakes. This sort of blind love, this sort of blind following, can be seen in the stock market as well. I might face a backlash for giving this example, but still I'll have to. Elon Musk the man who is capable of making the impossible possible. The man who brought dreams to reality. The man who brought science fiction in actuality became a celebrity in the business world. As his achievements, his books, his interviews, his cameos became popular. So did his company. Some know him because of Tesla. Some from the times of PayPal. And some due to the Joe Rogan interview whatever be the reason. His ability to make anything possible in a way got overestimated and the stock of Tesla in January 2021 crossed above 800 US dollars, trading above the PE of 750, which is perhaps the most expensive PE I have ever seen. But that's our man. He makes dreams possible. Higher PE in itself isn't a wrong thing. But it shows high hopes, high expectations of the investors. This faith of the people in their superstar rallied the stock by more than 400% in just a period of one year. Whether Elon Musk stands the test of time and whether he does meet their expectations, all is a different matter. The gist of all this is that people will do anything for the person they love. They will trust him with their money and sometimes even their life. The kind of behavior shown by these people turn out rewarding for the people like us. When Rakesh Junjunwala, also referred to as the Big Bull of India, picked up stake in struggling JP Associates, then its stock had shown a decent run. Then, in 2019, when he bought 1.3 crore shares of Yes Bank, then again, that stock rallied 6% in the same trading day and showed a spike for a few more days. Sunil Hightech Engineers, which was once called as the favorite of Porinju Veliath, that too had shown a decent gain when people knew he had invested. All these stocks today are trading near or at their lifetime lows. It isn't to show their failure but that of people's inability to recognize stocks by themselves. The strategy of superstar multibaggers is for those who believe in ideals. If you don't want to get your hands dirty, then simply follow the picks of these giants. Buy what they buy and sell what they sell. Not forever, but just for a while. It is just a trading strategy and not a strategy to invest. From the examples we know that whether the company is good or bad, there will be sheep that follow their leader and that stock will show a spike for a while. That is the period when you enter, not in stocks but via options. We know that the news of a superstar investing in XYZ company doesn't mark a long-lasting impact and the stock will come down once the fuel is burnt. So, as an opportunist, you just have to try and buy that stock during the speculated period and sell before the party ends. If the stock which that biggie has bought isn't in FNO, then simply avoid the deal. But after careful analysis, if you are convinced that the stock which they have bought is also fundamentally strong, then you may invest with cash. The best thing about the superstar multibaggers is that you always have a chance to get out. The news, social media or the blogs keep hammering that impression that such and such stock belongs to Mr. X-Star. 
This keeps momentum and volume going on in the stock and even after a few quarters. Now, theoretically, you cannot replicate the portfolio of these superstar investors because we do not know the quantity and price at which they have bought and the rights or privileges they have received for the transaction. So, this chapter isn't dedicated to teaching you that, but only to let you see a short-term opportunity, a trading window which is open when these biggies invest. It is based on first come and first go basis. If you buy the stock just at the time of the news and the stock yet has to be affected by the positive news, then you have a chance to earn a decent return in a short period of time. I also don't want to convey that this is the best way to earn money, but it is quite better than throwing random darts in the stock market. Much better than trading intraday without a sense of direction or a goal. Here, at least you have a reason to fail as well as to succeed and historically, almost all stocks rise higher for at least a week when any superstar invests in them. So, if you have some excess money to lose, better to bet it on these kind of stocks and wait for the surprise. Not only from the actions of these superstars, but you could also learn from their thoughts. Like in his latest interview, Rakesh Junjunwala said that India could have more than 50 crore DMAT accounts in the next 10 years. True or not, but this indirectly was a sign towards the only listed depository, CDSL. Thus, sometimes direct and sometimes indirect recommendations can be received from these superstars. If you don't want to follow them, then at least learn. Don't agree with their opinions, but at least listen. I guarantee that doing such will surely give you some signs, some lessons. After all, they are superstars for a reason. So then, we end our small chapter on superstar multibaggers. I hope it has given you a new way to see the world, a new perspective. Throughout the book, we'll have various kinds of multibaggers. Some you like and some you won't because we all have our own tastes. Traders will prefer a certain set of chapters, while investors would prefer another set of chapters. There will be differences. I understand and sometimes even things which might seem contradictory and it is bound to happen, because I am writing this book for both the kind of audiences. It's a mixture. Pick up, filter and sort out what you like and what you think is worthy and discard what seems non-essential. Don't judge this book on the collective opinion, but only through your own individuality. Go slow. Absorb the content. Think and try even to understand the contradictory view. Because when something seems useless, it is just your incompetence to use it rightly. Thank you so much for your time and I'll see you in the next chapter. Chapter 15. Deleveraged Multibaggers Quote your beauty is a depreciating asset. My intelligence is not. Unquote by Kalpesh Suryavanshi. There was a time when an idea was enough to get your business running. There was a time when you could just have your idea and the money would roll in your account from investors. That's how most businesses start. You don't have to show no revenue, no profit. Just your idea is enough. And most youngsters, the wannabe entrepreneurs, start their journey this way. And this way is the easiest way to start a business. I mean, who doesn't have a great idea? Almost all of us come across once in our lifetime. So, to start the first step is easy. But when you have nothing else except your ideas, then survival in the business world becomes tough. Because... It needs more than an idea. It demands hard work, dedication and leadership. Apart from that, it requires you to have strong execution skills and management qualities. The list is endless and yet with all this, chances of your success are still dim. And the reason for this is that what you have is something which everybody else has. That's why they are in business. 
Forget about getting in the top level of businesses. Only to survive. You need something which not all of us have access to. The skills you can learn or hire. The mindset you can develop or hire. But that one thing takes years of struggle, reputation and network which not all of us can achieve. Most people, the wannabes, dive into business not for the world but for themselves. They don't want to make people's lives easier but their own. They don't want to build a great product but a fortune for themselves, which is contradictory in itself. The world in which we live has developed a financial system in which you cannot take without giving. If you want to earn rupees 1000, you have to sell products worth 5000, that is OPM of 20%. If you want a lakh rupees, you should sell products or services worth 10 lakhs, that is OPM of 10%. If you want a crore, sell service worth 20 crore, that is OPM of 5%. There is no way you can take without giving. It is termed illegal. So, how do you do this? Even the smallest of small companies at least takes more than five years to attain stability. And if you want to narrow this period, you need that something which we discussed earlier. It was that something which helped Geo to attain a feat in just a few years which took decades for other telecom companies to achieve. It was because of that something that helped Amazon to stay ahead in the race compared to other e-commerce companies. What is that something? It is the vision of the future. Something which 90% of the businesses lack and that's why they are behind. Most people do business just to earn their livelihood, to keep the family business running or to satisfy their short-term urges. They don't want to grow. They don't want to go beyond. When they see a comfort level attained, they just want to settle. That's their goal. Their reason to start a business is their choice of mediocrity. Let me give you an example from my own life where I saw mediocrity fail in front of greatness. Where I saw business ruined due to its lack of vision about the future. The place where I live it's a small town where we don't have many quality education institutions nor do we have many companies to get employed after that mediocre education. There was, and it still is, just one solely dedicated business management college. I won't term it as great, but compared to the options I had, it still was a decent college. Just like most management colleges have, we too had an annual project fair where students from all sections would come up with their business idea and often a prototype to support it. It was my first year. I didn't participate. But I saw my seniors. There were two boys who had devised an Android app which was similar to that of the apps like Zomato and Swiggy. Since we didn't have neither Swiggy or Zomato in our city at that time, it was quite an invention. They weren't truly original in their approach because Zomato, Swiggy and alike were already functioning in other states of India. So we could say they were inspired. Anyhow, they had devised this Android app of theirs exclusively for our city. For this food delivery app, they got the first prize and enjoyed the celebrity moment on the stage. Weeks passed after the annual function and one day, there came a news that those seniors who made that app had actually dropped out of our college in order to pursue their business idea. The idea to deliver food through their app in our city. The map on how to start and run a delivery business was already over the internet. Anybody could see except they alone followed. They worked day and night trying to succeed in their business, delivering food by themselves on their bike meeting and tying up with restaurants and hotels in the locality. Months passed and their app on Play Store had crossed 10k plus downloads, which was an accomplishment in itself considering the size of our town. Then, a year passed and their business seemed to be profitable because by now, along with their app, 
they also had started a small sized restaurant of their own one day they were then invited to our college as guest speakers in order to share their journey and few pieces of motivation to us their juniors we were sitting in our college hall at the moment they entered the hall was full of applause and claps both of them turn by turn told us their journey and hardships on how they started how they delivered food despite the cold sun or rain how they worked 18 hours a day and how they had launched their own restaurant which they were very proud of the teachers the lecturers who once mocked them for dropping out from college were now clapping and cheering for them the program ended after an hour or two and everyone was talking about them we were in our college parking lot everyone in my friend circle was motivated by their journey and thought of how we too could have done it and how we too should all give it a try by creating another app it always happens when we see someone living a life we want to live we either love them or hate them in this case all were in love with their achievements but there was something which i had seen which others failed to see i saw that my seniors were too proud of their achievements they behaved as if they had attained whatever there was to be attained and when talking about their business they focused more on its past rather than the future it seemed as if they were content with what they had and were not willing to grow they lacked that something the vision of the future the storm that was yet to come it was the time when zomato and swiggy were aggressively expanding all over india and i knew in a year or two both of the companies would reach our city i knew both of them had lots of capital and they would lure away all the customers of my seniors via their marketing and crazy discounts i told the same to my friend who was just standing beside me but he just thought i was jealous and didn't give any attention after just 8 months after that incident the judgment day came zomato and swiggy both had entered the battle of food delivery business in our city they came like sharks they employed around 200 food delivery agents to deliver food gave them better incentives offered high commission to the restaurants for tying up and gave huge discounts almost 50% off on whatever you order it was something which my seniors perhaps had never thought of and just 2 months into this frenzy their business seemed to struggle their app got lower ratings since they weren't offering what others were and in a matter of weeks their monopoly was destroyed by the duopoly of zomato and swiggy after 2 years of that crisis those seniors are now left only with their small restaurant which is also struggling because the introduction of zomato and swiggy in our city also gave rise to other hotel businesses the reason for their failure was the lack of vision about the future they were too occupied with their instant fame than the growth of their business perhaps if they had predicted the inevitable then they could have prepared themselves for what was to come they could have either strengthened their business or could have sold their app early on to someone else because it is not easy to compete with giant businesses especially when they have huge cash to burn zomato and swiggy being unicorns of india had a large pool of funding an abundance of cash which they can use to destroy small businesses to give a 50% discount on services and dedicated support team and a fast interactive app which my seniors couldn't afford as they didn't have so much to spend they couldn't afford to take that risk there were individuals competing with institutions it is all about survival and cash is your weapon more cash means more strength it was the capital which gave geo an upper hand in telecom industry ambani also had other businesses from which he could divert the flow of capital to geo in its initial stages this way he built his foundation strong now there is a word for this kind of capital which i call leverage you see there are two ways to borrow money debt or equity 
Debt is one where you keep collateral as a security in exchange for money and equity is when you borrow money from people by giving them a percentage of partnership in your venture, which you call as shares. But there is also something different, leverage. It is similar to debt but also different. In leverage, you hedge something in exchange for money. So technically, it is close to debt. Now, most often, when you take debt, it is generally to loosen the burden of business. It is either to sustain the business or to pay for the expenses which you do not have the means to fulfill yet. So you borrow with a promise to pay in future with an interest. But leverage is different when it comes to the aim. In leverage, also you borrow but the goal is different. You borrow not to sustain the business but to grow the business. You leverage as an instrument to expand unlike debt whose goal is to survive the crisis. Take the example of same idea Vodafone and Geo. Both had borrowed money. Both used intensive amount of capital. But one used it to survive, that is, idea Vodafone, while the other used it to destroy, that is, reliance Geo. So the word debt, according to me, lies in the negative sense while leverage is a positive thing depending on how you use it. Now, by the above story and examples, I have tried to highlight the difference between debt and leverage while emphasizing their importance. Also, not everyone gets to have this benefit of leverage. It takes lots of years of reputation and network to build that trust so as to accumulate such heap of capital. And what is important when making use of leverage is the sense of the future. The ability to envision the future, else you might cut yourself with leverage. It's like a two-way sword. One cannot use leverage unless he is pretty sure what he is doing and what impact or what results can his actions cause in the future. Today, all the so-called unicorns of India are the companies which are using leverage, not debt. They are using it to outshine their competitors, to destroy small businesses, whether ethical or not is a completely different matter. Be it the educational unicorn Baiju, fintech startup Smallcase, self-publishing giant Notion Press or Zomato, Swiggy or Jiu, all are pearls of the same thread as of now. In 2005, Amazon had a debt of $1.56 billion. I am using this example because it is a classic example of the company which knows how to use leverage slash debt efficiently. It also is an evergreen multibagger more than deleveraged multibagger so we will have to deal carefully here. Now from the debt of $1.56 billion in 2005, the company by 2009 had reduced it to $0.11 billion in 2009. During this phase, the stock had more than doubled despite the 2008 crisis. Now, I won't attribute all this rise of stock to deleveraging because there were many things going on with Amazon at that time, but it did play some role in the process. Same goes with Reliance Industries, which in March QTR 2020 had a borrowing of 3.551 trillion rupees, which just in a year was reduced to rupees. 2.237 trillion, March QTR 2021. And during that phase, the stock of Reliance Industries has risen up by 65%. Again, I wouldn't attribute this spike to deleveraging, but it does play a role. Another company, Religare, a broking firm which had accumulated huge debt over the years had its highest debt number in 2016 of Rs. 202 billion and its stock fell to the low of Rs. 37 per share in 2017. But from then, the company seems to be deleveraging itself and now its latest debt number as of September 2020 is Rs. 53 billion, which is a significant effort in debt reduction. And from the low of 2017, after a rough journey and the ongoing pandemic, the stock is now trading at Rs 80 per share, 
giving us another example of deleveraged multibagger. The deleveraging is a sign that business is reaching a stage of stability while leveraging shows that the business isn't yet willing to settle and has aspirations to grow. Both in a way give us an opportunity to bag a multibagger. As all other multibaggers, these two carry a significant risk which can be avoided with careful analysis. You see, in our above examples, there are two kinds. First is Amazon Geo, which took debt as a tool to expand and with the right time, they reduced their burden and also as time required, they took it up again. They aren't fully deleveraged, even today. On the other hand, Relegear had taken up debt more to survive and compete rather than focus on expansion, unlike Amazon Geo. This makes Relegear a riskier bet than the other two. An example resembling to Relegear is that of Tata Motors, India's giant motor manufacturing company whose chairman, N. Chandrasekharan, in September 2020 said he expects the company to be zero debt in just next three years, which is a vision to deleverage a debt of 48,000 crore. Unlike Geo or Amazon, Tata Motors shall face a different set of problems. Their accumulation of debt had a different goal and due to the difference in the industries, it will get tougher. Most of the capital which Geo or Amazon got was by selling stake to others in equity, whereas Tata perhaps might have to sell many of its assets and manufacturing units. It is a completely different thing when deleveraging is carried out via debt and different when through equity. Capital acquired via equity shows the investor confidence in the business and its future while capital acquired via sale of assets is a sign of cleaning the mess. Both ways are beneficial to the companies but one way weighs more than the other in the long run. That is what I call the sense of future. So the great benefit would be in acquiring companies which had incurred debt to expand and not to survive, that is leverage. For this, you have to see how and on what the purpose is the company investing its capital. Is it to pay more salaries or to launch a new service? Is it to outshine the competition or just to stay in the business? Is it to innovate or only to survive? Is it to acquire new businesses or to buy superficial office spaces? The answers to these questions can be found in news, company or investor conferences annual reports, interviews, etc. So, getting updated about the company in which you had invested or plan to invest is very important. Before we end this chapter, let us see a summary of what we have learned and a takeaway of few key things. Number 1. Find out companies which are using leverage like they use marketing to build a brand and outshine the competition. Number 2. See if their results are aligning with their expectations. Often, most companies build hype, unrealistic expectations. Like the startup boom we are seeing today, not all of these unicorns shall succeed in the upcoming years and some might even disappear. This is a startup boom, where the rich and dumb are financing the crazy ideas of the millennials. Most unicorns haven't even found an answer as to how they're going to profit. Right now, they have abundant capital, funding which is being infused recklessly by some and this isn't going to last long. If they don't figure out soon the answer to profit, then the market won't spare them. They are surviving and growing on the expectations they have built about the future and time alone shall be the judge. Let's see. Again then, carefully place your bets on the companies that are using leverage. Number 3. Invest when you find the relation between the debt and profit. It should be inversely proportional to each other. If on the one hand a company is reducing its debt, then on the other hand its profits should increase. Its revenue, its business should increase. But if there is no relation, that is the profits remain unaffected whether the debt is high or low, then you are perhaps well off in avoiding that bet. Number 4. 
wait for a few quarters that is two or three quarters before placing your bet on a company that seems to deleverage itself because often just to manipulate the sentiments companies carry out a short termed debt reduction strategy this helps them increase their credit ratings for a while so they can take up more debt later number 5 buy only because of its business don't buy a crappy business just because it seems to deleverage itself it will raise its valuation in the short term but what about the longer run there isn't a time period i would recommend to be in deleverage multibaggers just know that the longer the better because the process of deleveraging might help them bring down the cost of financing the debt and this surplus capital could then be used effectively to improvise or expand their services or product range honestly then the time period will depend on the business you are looking at the time of investment this way you have to learn to adapt and adjust a few things from your own experience this book can help you to show the direction but the path you have to walk on your own i don't want my book to be a crutch for those who are financially handicapped i just want this to be a step which you can use to climb higher than what you are at i know this was quite a long chapter but also an important one in case you are tired take a nap and we'll meet you in our next chapter chapter 16 industrial multibaggers quote if that person or his family can run the business successfully for years and generations to come with same integrity and profitability then can't you even buy and hold its shares for a lifetime unquote by kalpesh suryavanshi invention is the core reason behind our evolutionary history we haven't just evolved physically but psychologically as well and the major contributors of that are our inventions from the discovery of the wheel to the invention of the cell phone which fits on our palm we as humans have come a long way our needs our desires our expectations our ideals our laws all change as the time progresses what we think as illegal today was once legal what we think as good was once termed evil and this works either way the fashion trends of the 90s are outdated today cigarettes and cokes in the previous century were sold as health fads while today we know that they are fatal all this change for better or worse maintains a cycle in businesses for example the first industrial revolution brought a demand for commodities like oil tea copper sugar etc second industrial revolution created demand for oil steel electricity etc third revolution as they called it was an era of digitalization the internet and television as you see then throughout our history demand for certain products increases while the demand of others lower and this cycle continues there was once a generation which grew listening to stories then came a generation which grew reading those stories in books later we saw a generation which entertained itself by listening to radio followed by the generation which spent hours in front of an idiot box the television and today we have kids that are spending more than 6 hours on a mobile or tablet either attending online school or just binge watching series this demand and supply make certain industries more profitable than their contemporaries like today due to the pandemic we are forced to stay at home and spend our time what we have today is the internet food groceries medicines entertainment education or be it our work almost all is carried out online via the internet 
and the ultimate beneficiary of this are the businesses who provide this facility like telecom companies for providing us the data entertainment companies like netflix or amazon prime educational platforms like byju's or unacademy delivery businesses like zomato or grofers there is an endless list of companies that are making money so is there a list of industries losing money like oil tourism real estate paints motor and vehicle industry and so on sometimes we can see industries progressing and the businesses in it growing but due to lack of access or due to lack of enough understanding we fail to buy certain businesses also it becomes quite risky when you try to invest in an unknown or unfamiliar industry where everything seems flowery like the dot com bubble of early 2000 when the internet was just this new magical thing and many companies started going online and any company which had a dot com in its name was a sure shot multibagger thousands of new internet businesses emerged during that era but over time only a handful of them have survived like that of google paypal or amazon so time and again we have seen that people get greedy and lose their common sense during such periods of euphoria and if you are inexperienced or lack the sense of business then chances are that you may fail and fail big losing all your money in the gamble now there is a way through which you can take advantage of this craze without risking a significant amount of your capital which i will tell you in the upcoming chapters until then let us see this example as i am writing this the second wave of the corona virus is going on business wise the greatest benefactor of the pandemic are the pharmaceutical companies the pharma industry till early 2019 the pharmaceutical industry was one of the most underperforming industries amongst the indian economy most pharmaceutical companies by that time had sales growth below 10% cagr in the past 5 year period and only a handful were the companies that were in profit some of it even were the giants of indian pharma industry then came the pandemic the fear the nationwide lockdown which created a demand for sanitation products masks sanitizers medicines and so on for most industries and for the indian economy the pandemic struck as a curse but the pharmaceutical industry took it as a boon an opportunity to earn big in these past 2 years alone the pharma index of nifty has risen by 50% and many stocks that are purely pharma or related to pharma have grown and multiplied by 200% This kind of growth seems to be unprecedented and the analysts are expecting it to continue till the next 5 years. A numerous number of pharma companies are reporting record high profits and beating each other's records every quarter. This isn't irrational euphoria cause there are numbers to back up their growth but there is always the sense of this party ending too early. What if you invest and all this gets over? You already are standing at the peak. There is excitement when you reach a peak, but there also is the fear of falling down. Also, pharmaceutics isn't an easy business to understand. There are patents, legalities, chemicals, equipment which are beyond the understanding of a common man. You can see they are profitable, but by selling what products? which medicine is it approved what are its side effects there are many things that can go wrong and the stock in a moment may start crashing and if you don't know what to do when the stock is down then you have invested in a wrong business we don't need direction when everything is all right we need it when things aren't going according to the expectations and when you invest just because the stock is going up 
or on somebody else's recommendation, then you better know what to do when it will come down. Verily, the pandemic isn't going to last forever. Neither will the companies keep growing at such an astounding rate. Nor will the stocks keep going up. It has to come down some day, consolidate and it would be that time when you will have to decide whether to hold or to sell. So what to do? You don't understand those businesses but you still want to make money out of it. Is it possible? If yes, what's the right way? You see, the best way is always to invest in individual stocks but since we have established that we don't understand the business or the industry in which it is operating, then there are two ways. Both are relatively safe and financially rewarding. First way is to buy the index fund of that particular industry via SIP or lump sum. For example, in our case, we saw that the pharma industry as a whole is going through its heydays. Then, the best way after individual stocks is to buy the pharma index. In our case, it would be the Nifty Pharma Index. In our case, we also saw that internet companies like Netflix, Google, Microsoft, Amazon, etc. are gaining because of this pandemic and buying them individually would be risky plus expensive. Then again, you could do so by investing in America's tech index NASDAQ 100 via mutual funds which allow you to start as low with a capital of Rs 500 alone. Second way is comparatively difficult and I will tell you why. Second best option is looking out for mutual funds that are industry specific. Like if you expect a boom in the pharma industry and want to be a part of it then you could search for mutual funds that only invest in pharmaceutical companies. Same for IT. If you want to invest in technology and internet companies, then search for mutual funds that invest in companies belonging to that particular sector only. Now, the reason why I term this way as comparatively difficult is that when investing in an industry via its index gives a sense of security no matter what. You will earn average of what the companies have earned. It also involves less hassle and lower costs whereas the method of actively managed mutual funds will require you to choose amongst the many. We have many asset management companies in India and they all have their own kind of funds in various flavors designed for people with various age or risk appetite. So, even if you're shopping for an industry-specific mutual fund, you'll still have to choose based on its asset allocation, expense ratio, its manager, his experience and so on. I would say go for the second way. The path of actively managed mutual funds when there isn't any ETF or index method of investment available. If you have a way to use the index approach, well and good. But if not, then choose from the second way. Choose the mutual fund under a known banner, which has a lesser expense ratio and one with an experienced manager. I also understand that it won't be possible to get all this in one package. So you might have to sacrifice one thing for the other. So this was our chapter on industrial multibaggers, short and simple. These shall be situational picks. All you have to see which industry is dominating the market. If you see pharma, invest in pharma. If you see IT, go for the index of Nifty IT. Most importantly, when you don't see any industry dominating the market, then choose the diversified index. In India, we don't have an equivalent of America's S&P 500, which is a well-diversified index. In that case, I would say go with Nifty 50. Perhaps someday we'll also have a diversified index for our country's stock market. But until then, Nifty 50 would be your choice. Chapter 17 Recovery Multibaggers Quote The present you are living in today 
is the future you had planned yesterday so if you are not happy today then you are a lousy planner unquote by kalpesh suryavanshi the stock market is a roller coaster ride most of the time it goes upwards but when it starts crashing down then there is no estimate of its low sometimes the crash is so great that even the mightiest of all companies sink in as we saw in the case of industrial multibaggers it is the time that even the penny stocks in that industry during its peak period turn multibaggers the boom in an industry is like a wave which pushes everything ahead in its path which i called as the industrial multibaggers rather than stock specific multibaggers because the instance is such that even the worst companies in that industry show a rise similar to what we saw in the dot com bubble of 2000 where any company with dot com in it grew multifold just like this boom is infectious so is the crash the period of high pessimism in the market the fear the panic causes even the bluest of blue chips to fall like a house of cards the period of crash is like the period of high sales a discount where a number of great indian businesses are available at cheaper rates this is in a way the best possible time to invest in equities but the impact of pandemic all around is so intense that even the confidence of so called experts analysts fund managers gets shaken we know that the market is low but whether it will go lower cannot be determined as the market keeps making low day by day there is always that fear of missing out and also the anticipation that what if we buy and instead of rising it falls more there is a reason why the crash is referred to as the period of great uncertainty it is this that you don't know whether it will fall more tomorrow or rebound thousands of people lose crores during the crash hundreds of businesses go bankrupt millions lose their jobs all of a sudden the money giving tree turns into a money eating dragon there is no hope around just darkness there could be various reasons why these crashes occur like a financial crisis war national emergency politics pandemic etc greater the potential damage greater will the stocks fall there are also minor crashes like the one caused during the period of demonetization in india or during the mumbai or uri attacks it all starts small a minor crash also has a potential to turn itself into a major crash but there is always an opportunity hidden in adversity and the ones who take this chance are the people who will find the recovery multibaggers it isn't actually that difficult to find out the recovery multibaggers since we have already learned enough to know about them the recovery multibaggers are simply those stocks which are on sale and have the qualities of sure shot and evergreen multibaggers combined most importantly is the sale part when you buy the sure shots and evergreens during the crash you are essentially buying the recovery multibaggers the concept of recovery multibaggers is that they have a guarantee to recover post the crash this makes them relatively safe and it is timed to give us a decent return in a matter of a few years or even months the best of all recovery multibaggers is the index itself since there is pandemic the whole market is crashing and if you can't figure out individual stocks during that period and are afraid or lack surety about your judgment then simply keep adding the units of the whole index through etf or mutual fund the index being already diversified and is proportional to the market cap of the companies underlying it so you need not worry about it you have a ready made portfolio in the form of an index so there shouldn't be any problem now the thing which i am about to talk about is 
something which rarely occurs but it has and is ongoing. When there is a crash which is caused due to financial emergency or global crisis, then the industries, most of them, get affected. But there are times when there is a crash only in certain sectors while the other sectors are booming. Like if there is a war, then by nature industries related to defense like weapon companies, steel, companies that produce defense vehicles, logistics, etc. will thrive. While others which have non-essential goods like travel, tourism, luxury, jewelry, etc. might fall. This is a general view. It also depends on the kind of war and its scale. Sometimes people start hoarding gold during such times so companies mining or designing gold may also benefit. Sometimes food scarcity benefits the companies operating in that sector or related to that sector. So war and its impact on the stock market is quite a complex topic which is beyond the scope of our book. Simply understand that wars may cause the overall market to crash or only a handful of sectors to tumble while others benefit. Pandemic as we see today is also similar to the period of war. In its initial phase, during the nationwide lockdown, almost all businesses were affected negatively. But as time progressed and we took control of the situation, certain industries started benefiting while others are still stuck. Industries like giant production houses, theater businesses, travel and tourism, airline, trains, luxury goods, electrical appliances, motor companies, etc. are some which are still struggling and aren't operating with their full capacity. So there is a rise in certain industries which are referred to as industrial multibaggers and there are industries which are struggling which fall under the category of recovery multibaggers. The industries that are suffering today have a potential to recover in future. So, the recovery multibaggers can be found here. But unlike industrial multibaggers, we won't be taking the basket approach in this case. It is because during the boom, even the penny stocks turn multibaggers because of the euphoria, so it is effortless. However, to recover, to rise from the ashes, it takes strength that not all businesses have. Hence, taking the industry basket approach for recovery of multibaggers will be a bad idea. If you want to search for them, just go to the industries where there is the highest amount of pessimism and try to find stocks which have the qualities of both sure shot and evergreen multibaggers. If we take the current situation as a guide, then the PSU banks are the ones which are suffering the most. We also have theatre businesses that are struggling or the travel tourism industry. Search. Look out for the safest bets. Things which give you hope. Don't risk your money because crash isn't the time to do so. If you risk your principal today, you won't have any for tomorrow. Play safe until you see hope. Trust your instincts. Note, just in case you have a confusion, when the crash is impacting the whole market, like that of financial crisis, then you can choose to take the index basket approach. But if the crash is only industry specific, then choose only individual stocks which seem safe and have the qualities of evergreen as well as sure shot. One might also ask, what if I want to take risk during the crash and buy other stocks instead of evergreens or sure shot? Answer, you sure can, but they won't be termed as recovery multibaggers, even if they do recover. It is because, by definition, the recovery multibaggers are meant to be relatively safe and are those that have a greater chance of recovery. I hope then, it clears all the doubts. This perhaps was a confusing chapter. I don't know. I tried my best to simplify. Chapter 18 Lightning Multibaggers 
they show you the short term return and encourage you to invest for the long term hypocrites unquote by kalpesh suryavanshi when the sky gets covered with the dark clouds you feel the wind blowing fast and just for a moment the sky lights up followed by the sound of thunder that is lightning just like these lightning in nature there are lightning multibaggers in the financial market these are the stocks which light up the market for a while create some buzz and fade away unlike rumored multibaggers these have a rational reason behind their growth even if it is for a while and just like the lightning you cannot catch these stocks you'll see them you'll hear about them but perhaps never be able to hold them in brackets unless lucky bracket closed just like the lightning the stock of that company rises up in just a few trading sessions they create a thunder that is buzz in the market and then fade away like nothing happened like our real world there are also various seasons of the business some seasons that is quarters it makes a lot of money while some quarters it barely reaches the expectations and once in a while there also comes a season when the harvest is too good the profit is outstanding which could be due to various reasons sometimes the business has decided to make a sale of its non performing unit or asset and due to the demand they get a greater value in exchange for it and this number of other income inflates the net profit during the quarter and eventually that year sometimes the promoters in the business decide to increase their stake in great proportion which again raises the stock higher or the company acquires a new piece of land or unit which is expected to increase its future output which again takes the stock upward you can then see that there are many of these sometimes situations which are once in a while events and the market reacts accordingly greater the contribution higher the stock goes The reason why we can't get hold of these opportunities is that they are all related to the internal matters of the company or what you call as the insider information. You can be lucky that you buy and the very next day such news comes out but intentionally and legally it isn't possible since there are more than 5000 companies. If you want to know about such incidents and occurrences then you can visit the BSE's official site and check for the top gainers list. You'll find some there but you cannot hold them. Just like lightning when you see it it has already passed. You are just seeing the mental image of it. If you cannot find them cannot hold them then what use is this chapter? It is solely for the purpose to let you know that there always and will be things beyond your control, opportunities beyond your grasp. See them, understand them, but don't feel saddened for losing them out. Learn to make peace with things which are beyond your control because sometimes it is better to let go. Also, when you'll see these kind of multibaggers in the market, you'll know that it is better to lose them than trying to catch hold of them most people who don't understand these lightning multibaggers get disheartened for missing out and they make a mistake in trying to catch them and lose more money in this process yes there are people who get lucky in the stock market but you cannot force luck you cannot put effort and be lucky such is the case for lightning multibaggers if you are lucky you might find and hold one but don't try More people have lost fortunes in finding these than the people who have made fortunes in these. Just know that there are these kind of multibaggers. Understand and just witness this beauty of the market. Chapter 19: The Commodity Multibaggers. Quote: Predicting the future is easy. Maintaining its accuracy is not. unquote by kalpesh suryavanshi do you remember the tulip mania from chapter 13 the phenomenon 
where a rare breed of flower became so expensive that people had to almost shell their life savings to buy it. Remember from the chapter of Demand and Supply Multibagger? If not, give it a small rewind and come back. Just by the name of this chapter, one can conclude that the multibaggers discussed herein are related to commodities and for this, you need to have a basic understanding of certain things. First, what is the market? It is a place where buyers and sellers meet to make trade, an exchange at a mutually acceptable price. Therefore, the stock market is a place where stocks slash shares get traded, which in the digital era we call as being traded on the exchange. Now, there is a market where bonds get exchanged, which we call the bond market. Similarly then, there is a market, an exchange, where commodities get exchanged or traded. This we call as the commodity market. In India, we have two of those major commodity markets, multi-commodity exchange, MCX, and national commodity exchange, NCDEX. Now, what are the commodities that get exchanged or traded here? Both the exchanges have various sets of commodities that trade on their platform. For example, MCX has bullions like gold and silver, base metals like aluminium, zinc, etc. Energy like crude oil and natural gas, agri-commodities like cotton, cardamom, rubber, etc. NCDEX, on the other hand, has cereals and pulses like barley, chana, maize, etc. Fibers like cotton and gore seeds, oil and oil seeds like soya bean, mustard, etc. Sugar and spice like turmeric, jeera, etc. Now, the question is, who buys all these things on these exchanges? You see, when we need something like a vegetable or fruit, we go and buy it from the nearest fruit or vegetable market. Similarly, Companies that produce sugar products need sugar. Companies producing clothes need fibers. Companies in chemical or manufacturing need oil. Jewelry companies need silver and gold. Where do they get all this from? From the markets. From the exchanges we discussed above. There are contracts that trade in these markets which have a prefixed lot size for each commodity. The companies enter these contracts and buy these commodities at the specified price. Now, apart from companies, individuals like us too can trade in this market, which is more often a speculative activity. Nevertheless, we now just have to focus on the companies and how they influence this market. You see, almost all the markets are built on the same fundamental rules of demand and supply. When there is less supply but more demand, then the commodity becomes expensive. When there is too much supply but a little demand, then the commodity becomes cheap. Unlike the price of manufactured products, where they always try to sell above the cost price, the commodity market ignores that rationale and transacts the commodity solely through demand and supply, regardless of the value of the commodity or its conception slash manufacturing cost. This is also one reason why our farmers suffer more losses than our corporations. The law of demand and supply is flawed in its approach because it keeps aside the value of the product and judges it only on the number of people willing to buy and to sell. Due to this law, there was once a time when aluminium was more expensive than gold and also because of this law alone that today aluminium is one of the cheapest metals on earth. It was in the 19th century when aluminium was harder to obtain and due to the law of demand and supply, it became the precious element of that century. It became a symbol of wealth. Kings and queens often used spoons and plates made up of aluminium, while gold and silver utensils were reserved for inferior guests. It was during this time in 1884 when the Washington Monument of the United States was capped with six pounds of aluminium, which is still present up to date. You see then, 
people don't understand value and so to fool those ignorance the law of demand and supply was introduced anyhow in order to identify commodity multibaggers one must have sufficient understanding of the law of demand supply and that of the commodity markets okay take a hypothetical example suppose india is the world's second largest exporter of wheat japan being the first now due to some reason japan is faced with a huge calamity like tsunami which destroys most of the areas where wheat is grown what would be the outcome for india answer since the competitor japan is suffering its loss will be our gain india and the demand for its wheat will increase globally thereby benefiting indian farmers and indian corporations which are engaged in wheat production now if there were only wheat related companies in the market x having a strong market share and y being a weak player then our common sense would lead us to buy shares of x company since it is obvious that company x will benefit from the tsunami which has occurred in japan so all you need here in this example was some common sense and a bit of intellect to link those dots and in reality if you develop this then you can find and buy commodity multibaggers in their early phases commodity multibaggers are the companies which turn multifold because the price of commodities they are dealing with turn favorable for them for example a company that sells clothes would like cotton prices to fall so they can buy raw material at a cheaper price or the company that mines gold would like its prices to go up so people would pay more for the same work and situations like these keep arising every year today we have oil prices at comparatively lower prices so the companies engaged in oil mining or refining are expected to suffer while the companies that use oil as raw material like chemical paint or engine oil companies shall benefit however as this pandemic isn't going to be permanent as demand picks up oil prices too may rebound creating oil mining and refining companies as the commodity multibaggers so when the price of any commodity rises or falls there is always someone who will benefit and the one who will lose and your job as a commodity multibagger should be to stay on the winning side the demand and supply in the market keeps fluctuating and it keeps the prices of commodities volatile but if you can understand that volatility and develop a relation between the stock market and the commodity market then none can stop you from finding the commodity multibaggers you see just like you most people in the stock market are unaware of these relationships but for you having knowledge of both these markets can be rewarding both financially as well as intellectually now it takes lots of time and understanding for an event which has occurred in the commodity market to cause its impact in the equities market it often takes weeks for a news item from the commodity market to cast its impression on the stock market sometimes you can see it in the news but the stocks are still left to be touched by it this gives you a chance to enter so what are the risks associated with these kinds of multibaggers number 1 uncertainty the impact which the commodity can cause on the business is certain theoretically but practically it takes time to occur sometimes companies have reserves left which often shield them from certain price rises since we as investors don't know the price at which the company holds its commodity reserves we cannot estimate its price impact on the business accurately number 2 volatility since you are dealing here with both equities and commodities you are in a way handling twice the volatility twice the risk sometimes commodity prices fall down or rise up due to known global factors you buy equity based on that assumption and in time the situation may turn sideways Therefore it is better to always choose safer and relatively stable companies when thinking of commodity multibaggers. Number 3 lack of information. 
Today, with the world of the internet, we are overwhelmed with excess data and unrequired information. This creates a void and disturbs the part of the brain which is responsible to make decisions. Due to excess information, we always have that feeling that what we have isn't enough. So, even with excess, we have that sense that we don't have sufficient information and the confidence to carry out or hold the trade dissolves, forcing us to sell at a loss. Let us now move towards the things to remember when investing in commodity multibaggers. Number 1. Set a target. No matter what, Whenever you are dealing with stocks which you are supposed to hold for a limited time period, it is important that you set a target in your mind. Know the reason why you have bought that stock and how much time frame it would take to realize that expectation. Number 2. Choose the best players. Whenever you find a deal relating to commodity multibaggers, try to invest in the biggest beneficiary, the ones who have stronger market share and stable balance sheets. Always keep in mind the most important thing when investing is to safeguard the principle. Number 3. Stay tuned with the news. Normally, in most cases of multibaggers, I would have said to avoid the noise in the market because it disturbs the mind and shakes our confidence. But in this case, we have invested based on the movement in two markets and so every news related to any of that market is important. How are the things turning out for that commodity globally? What are the steps the government is taking to resolve the price issue of this commodity? Is there a political angle? How could currency market impact this deal, etc. are lots of variables when investing in these kinds. So, the shorter your holding period will be, the less stress you will have about being updated on the ongoings. Initially, it might cause you some trouble, but with time, all this will just be natural and finding commodity multibaggers will be as effortless as reading this chapter. Chapter 20 Thematic Multibaggers Quote Good idea doesn't mean a good business. Unquote by Kalpesh Suryavanshi The world as we know today has got closer due to the technology we have. We can see, hear and know what is happening all over the globe by sitting just at our homes which makes us closer to being omnipresent. We have trends on social media that origin in the West while the East imitates. And we have always looked towards the West for directions, be it in business, medicine, technology or even defence. Even though the sun rises in the East, it looks towards the West for light. Hence, the multibaggers which I am about to talk about belong to the themes that have their roots in the West and for this you need to have enough knowledge about business trends going on in the world but specifically America since it is a hub of new ideas, businesses and technology. There was a time in history when the world was thrilled with the invention of electricity and anyone who could capitalize it was rewarded heavily in the business which gave us people like Thomas Edison. There was also a time when people were experimenting with vehicles which could be used for daily commuting. This is the time when the business world met Henry Ford. Fast forward to the late 20th century, aka the era of personal computers that gave birth to people like Bill Gates and Steve Jobs. It was followed up by the age of the internet which gave us people like Jeff Bezos and Mark Zuckerberg. So, there is always this period where a certain invention or a certain technology dominates the market, the business world. It is a time when particular ideas in business are more encouraged, supported and appreciated. The consumer loves their products. The analysts applaud these ideas. Investors cherish these opportunities and the whole market prepares itself for a dream run based on these themes. If you look today, then information and technology still dominates the structure of many businesses. Things like data mining, artificial intelligence, electric cars, self-driving vehicles, blockchain, green energy, 
e-commerce, etc. are some themes which are about to revolutionize the world we live in. Therefore, there is no doubt that the businesses which can effectively capitalize on these inventions will turn into multibaggers, which we then call the thematic multibaggers. Now, there are certain things which should be noted. First, the themes last only for a specified period and so do the businesses, which are dependent solely on those themes. No thematic multibagger can turn evergreen unless it diversifies itself in other ongoing themes or stable methods of income. Just take an example of Amazon. It started as an e-commerce company, but to stay evergreen it had to diversify and now it carries out various other businesses activities like production, streaming, publishing, e-wallets and perhaps even space exploration. Same case is with Tesla, Microsoft, Facebook, etc. They are thematic multibaggers. They started by betting on a theme that was playing out during their time but eventually had to adapt since the theme had its limit. They would die out if they didn't evolve, which they did via diversification and transformed themselves from thematic multibaggers to the evergreen multibaggers. In India, we have a similar case of Reliance Industries, which is a thematic multibagger turned evergreen. It always bets on the themes which are supposed to drive the economy. They started with textile, then petroleum, followed by telecom, and now they are betting heavily on data and internet. Reliance also has other businesses, but the major chunk of revenue they get is always from the theme which they have bet on during that period like in 2020. Today, the major contributor of their revenue is none other than Reliance Geo or as they call it, Geo Platforms. Having read the above examples, one may perhaps start thinking that thematic multibaggers are the best of all multibaggers because they are growth-oriented, easy to identify and safer in terms of risk. And I won't say you are completely wrong in your assumption. You see, the problem with companies that bet on a particular theme is that they are quite in a hurry, often immature, and are betting on the particular theme just because they have a fear of missing out. Just like children who choose a certain career option only because it is in trend and provides a better growth opportunity in career as well as monetarily. Now, I wouldn't say that being ambitious is wrong. We all have aspirations but when you choose to be something which you are not, which is beyond your strengths and your interests, then you are doomed to make a wrong choice. And similar things happen with the management and their businesses. After all, they are humans like us. The extension of this mistake is also seen in the novice investors who try to bet on the hot stocks, the hot themes hoping to catch a multibagger without doing any careful analysis. Remember in the case of industrial multibaggers? We saw that due to the trend in that sector, even the worst of the stocks in that sector started outperforming the average. But in the case of thematics, which may seem similar to industrials, is the difference of individual strength. Thematic multibaggers are not industrial multibaggers. They are individual companies which bet on a particular theme, regardless of it being in trend throughout the industry or not. Some themes are playing out in the West while an Indian company may start betting on it early on, even before the industry knows about it. These are the early starters who structure their business according to that theme even before it is popular in that country or the industry. Also, there are many problems when you see these early starters. Sometimes they are inexperienced, incompetent or are those who are playing with fire. It is because not all themes can be capitalized effectively. Not all business ideas earn you money. Not all inventions are productive and not all technology is economical or practical. Some are themes which work in the West but don't in the East. Also are themes that are more suitable for East than the West. So, all the above factors need to be carefully examined when you are thinking of betting on thematic multibaggers. According to Wikipedia, in quotes, there were at least 100 automobile companies that had begun operations in Detroit by the beginning of the 20th century. 
but in the 1920s there were only 3 left which controlled 70% of the market in that industry the big 3 companies were general motors ford and chrysler which all claimed almost 94% of all automobile sales in 1955 1956 and 1959 unquote as you can see then How low is the survival rate when companies start off by betting on a theme? Another thematic mania was the dot com bubble. The period between 1995 to 2000 when hundreds of companies started betting on the theme of internet. You could see multiple IPOs of tech/internet companies being launched during the period, which created a bubble since most companies in it were superficial and had no real business model. Today, as we see, only a handful of those companies have survived like that of Amazon and eBay. So every time there is this theme like this and companies which are trying to play on these themes which get competitive and may often lead to a bubble. Since the world changes and it changes faster with time, we have many themes today in the IT sector where businesses are placing their core on. Like artificial intelligence, blockchain, e-commerce, self-driving vehicles, green energy, etc., to name a few as stated earlier. Now, our job as thematic multibagger is not to search for a great company in that pit, but to filter out the worst companies from that list. What would be left over will be our multibagger. So, what steps and what method should be used to find a thematic multibagger? what are its qualities and what should be the time frame to stay invested let us address this problem one by one steps to be taken to find thematic multibaggers number 1 stay updated with current business trends throughout the world specifically the west since developing countries of the east are highly inspired by them number 2 sort out the themes which seem economically feasible and have a potential to acquire strong market share number 3 choose a business which is betting on that theme but also has a competent management if not experienced number 4 time frame would depend on individual cases above are also the steps as well as qualities common in the thematic multibaggers they bet on a theme which has the potential to revolutionize the future their model must be economical and should have a competent team of management you see the reason why i added the point that these themes should have an economically feasible model is that there are certain themes which we know were outstanding but still have failed like the theme of green energy be it solar or wind and the reason for their failure is the nature of their business itself due to the limitations of current technology we cannot produce enough green energy so as to light the world these alternate sources require lots of initial capital deployment which isn't possible for small players or for the underdeveloped or even for some developing countries Besides non-renewable energy sources are easier to obtain and we have all our factories plants houses vehicles designed to run on those fuels which makes this green energy less popular even though it is environmentally rewarding perhaps in future we might see a change in this theme and its businesses but as of now the possibility of finding multibaggers that bet on this theme of green energy are rare and if you are lucky enough to stumble upon one then it might turn big one never knows same is the case with electric vehicles the motor manufacturing business is already very competitive and capital intensive besides for one to sell electric cars first he should make sure he has his charging stations set up and running throughout the country this all will almost be like starting a new train company where you don't sell engines first but build tracks for trains to run on them by saying all this i don't mean to undermine the efforts done by these businesses but i'm just mentioning that not all of the companies you see today in this list will survive most businesses that are betting on electric cars green energy etc won't survive because these themes are riskier by their nature whereas companies betting on the themes of data e-commerce 
artificial intelligence etc are comparatively less riskier and safer to invest in however in this case don't choose the industrial multibagger approach make sure you find a company which has some of the qualities of evergreen multibaggers so as to minimize the risk in hand and with this tip we would end our chapter of thematic multibaggers Chapter 21 Global Multibaggers Quote Poor values money rich values time Unquote by Kalpesh Suryavanshi In our previous chapter we discussed how businesses bet on certain themes and make big in the world Now we are going to see the companies which have already made big by ruling in their home country and are now on the quest of global domination Global multibaggers are the companies that don't have local origin. In our case, they don't originate in India but come from foreign nations via IPO and get listed in the market. Since these companies are already well known and have a proven business model, they don't face much difficulty in acquiring capital and they try to expand aggressively throughout a country. and with time if they are consistent in their approach and succeed to rule the hearts of the population then eventually they do turn into multibaggers some successful examples of these global multibaggers in india are png gillet dominos aka jubilant foods mcdonalds aka westlife development 3m india colgate etc These are the companies which have given exceptional returns over the past and some even stand tall as blue chips of India. The reason behind their success is their ability to adapt themselves according to the needs of the Indians who prefer affordable yet quality products. If you produce a quality product and price it more expensive, then Indians normally tend to avoid it and go for the second best option. Indians may not be value sensitive but they certainly are price sensitive which is the reason why apple products have yet to reach their peak phase in the indian market while companies like oppo vivo or xiaomi are taking over overall then it may seem quite simple finding these global multibaggers but as always such ain't the case Most global companies make big in India due to the reference they have with the west and its lifestyle but not all companies make such fortune There are companies which have tried entering the Indian markets companies which were big in the American markets but failed to make an impression on the minds of Indians Simple reason is that either their products were not affordable valuable or lacked both Some examples of global companies failing in India are General Motors the car company Kellogg's the cereal company Dunkin Donuts Danone the dairy company etc and the reasons for their failure in India was that they were extravagant they sold things that didn't suit the preferences of the middle and lower class people which is almost 80% of the population Some failed due to mismanagement or due to misplacement of their products like eating cereals and donuts for breakfast isn't what Indians prefer Now we have the good companies and the bad companies we have seen what seems to have worked while also things which have failed so how does one know which to buy and when Now most companies that belong to this category are the ones which have already made an impression in their country and they hope to achieve the same in India. Therefore, when they come to India, they start by setting up a few stores or units in the metros of the country. These initial years give them a sentiment test of the Indians and also their choices. Since the company is foreign their initial years are spent in trial and error of their products and services in order to suit the taste of Indians This phase of trial and error is crucial for the company to become a multibagger since their parent company has abundant capital money isn't the problem for them but time is 
Depending on the period they have entered in India, it should not take more than a period between 5 to 8 years to turn profitable in India. If the company seems to take more time, then it is either wasting its efforts or is either too slow to adapt. It would also depend on the nature of the product or the service which it is providing, like heavy industry businesses, like car manufacturing or a bank could take longer. But businesses like restaurants, softwares, e-commerce, social media, etc. shouldn't take much time. Hence, there will be certain things which will be beyond the general conventions and you'll have to look individually at those cases. One might also try visiting their nearby franchise or buying their product in order to get first-hand experience of their service. It would give you a better insight as well as provide cues that could help you make a better judgment. Like individually, as far as my experience is concerned, I prefer Amazon for buying stuff online over its Indian contemporary Flipkart. Some reasons include swift delivery, better price discovery, greater options, better support teams. Therefore, getting first-hand experience tells you a lot not only about the company but also its peers from which you had shopped earlier. You get to know and choose the one which is better. You might also want to look at the numbers. Most global companies prefer to expand aggressively which spike up their revenue and to do this, they also have to take up a sizable portion of debt which again is normal thing to do for most businesses today. But what is important is that these numbers should convert from loss to profit, from negative cash flow to positive. Granted, the company may need debt in the beginning, but with its maturity, the curve should go upwards, at least making the company network positive. But if you see a business which is global, yet struggling in India for more than a decade, still surviving on the capital of its parent company, then such ain't going to be a global multibagger. It cannot live off its parents' capital throughout. It has to, at some point, have its own needs fulfilled by itself, else it is nothing but a failed business. This ability to see what doesn't work is actually the key to finding global multibaggers. Almost all of these global companies have something going on with them. They also carry a placebo with their name since they are already successful in other countries. Therefore, almost all may seem worth investing and rarely will there be a component of disappointment. So, on the surface they all seem good and we only need to find the best. Theoretically, the success ratio of investing in global companies is quite good. Just a handful of those fail. Only thing important is to stay on the winning side as often as possible. In the end, the only mantra I could give you to find the best of global multibaggers is to choose based on your personal preference. Go out, see the product, buy the service and answer the following questions. Number 1. Do you like the product slash service? Number 2. Do you accept the price they have charged you for it? Number 3. Would you recommend this product slash service to your friends or family members or relatives? Number 4. Does it make you feel good even if it seems a bit expensive? Number 5. Do you imagine yourself using this company's product or service for the next 5 years? If the answers for the above questions are affirmative, then chances are you have found your global multibagger. But mind you, not to use these questions as ultimate ideals, but just as guides to serve your purpose. Understand that things do change with time and so will these questions. If you have understood the gist of this chapter, then you don't even need these questions and you will still be equipped with enough understanding to fetch one of these global multibaggers by yourself. Chapter 22 Economic Reform Multibaggers Quote Each transaction is a learning experience. Bigger the price you pay, the greater importance the lesson has. Unquote by Kalpesh Suryavanshi. In 1947, when India became independent from colonial rule, 
for a brief period we directed our economic assistance greatly towards the agricultural sector for we wanted to have a food surplus and be self sufficient when it came to feeding our growing population but soon we realized that without industrial growth such aim was unachievable we saw examples like the countries in west and east like japan growing on the pillars of their industries and our government felt the urge to focus in that direction taking up the socialist approach we then established many public sector undertakings in brackets psus like steel authority of india in brackets sail state bank of india in brackets sbi coal india and many such over the period of time then came the lpg reforms in brackets liberalization privatization and globalization bracket closed which took the indian economy to its peak some of the works synonymous to lpg reforms are still going on where we are trying to open our doors for foreign businesses by easing norms lowering taxes all under the banner of make in india looking back we can say that we have come a long way and it was quite a rewarding journey throughout we faced wars national emergency natural calamities political debacles but never have we faced any financial emergency we were once a great nation mightiest on earth we fell and are now rising again as a leading player in the world economies unlike singapore or canada we aren't fully a capitalist economy but a mixture of both socialist as well as capitalist aka mixed economy we have entities and corporations owned fully or partly by the government often referred to as psus we also have instances where the government has intervened in matters of private companies so as to safeguard the general public's interest we also have regulatory authorities like sebi or entities amfi to look over the matters in the market therefore the political scenario going on in the state or nation does affect the businesses operating within the boundaries of india every year the finance minister of the country who often belongs to the ruling party announces the national budget of the country it is the time for certain businesses to get a push while some get a pull some businesses get subsidies while some get the relief some businesses are encouraged while some discouraged then it is followed up by monetary policies which is quite important for the banks as the interest rates slr crr etc are dictated to the banks by the rbi which is also referred to as the bank of banks since every investor in the market is also a voter if not a voter he or she at least has his slash her own political preference and inclination towards certain ideologies and expectations from the government so throughout the year there are these instances of volatility and uncertainty in the market which is caused due to the indifference in opinions and expectations of people involved in the market these are the times of annual budget rbi policies elections global meetings etc some parties are considered positive for the market while some negative some budgets are rewarding for certain industries while some are disappointing some announcements favorable while some unfavorable during these phases many involve a great amount of speculation in order to make quick bucks and similar are the multibaggers discussed in this chapter these are the stocks that give an exceptional return in a short period of time due to the political factors going on industry wise the biggest beneficiaries of the budget are banks heavy industries commodity or agricultural industries etc while banks benefit or suffer the most during the policies of rbi now then stocks that rise or fall during this period do so because of anticipation the expectations of the market This is the time when one should look at public sector undertaking for the search of short-term multibaggers. 
you can see stocks hitting upper circuits or lower circuits on the same day depending on the kind of announcement if the news is highly positive then you can see stocks giving a return greater than 50% in a matter of weeks just after the announcements this often happens with banks or companies that are operating in infrastructure development like housing or roads some sessions also impact the agricultural stocks like that of sugar manufacturing companies seed or pesticide companies etc since all of this cannot be predetermined or analyzed one can do nothing but speculate as a guiding trail in search of these short term multibaggers one can start by tuning in to the news and listening to the opinions of the analysts and try if you find some sense in their assumptions definitely after or during the announcement some of them will be right and some wrong if you are a rational person then you shouldn't trade in these stocks but if you want to speculate and want to get that adrenaline rolling then you can take your chances the reason why i have dedicated a chapter to these kinds of speculative multibaggers knowing that they are difficult to actualize is to serve the exact same purpose when you see these stocks reaching peaks on the day of budget or certain announcement you'll know that this was an opportunity you missed not because of your lack of market sense but because of your intelligence in preserving your capital by maintaining a distance from such speculative activity the people who will earn during this period might also lose during this period so don't worry if you can't catch hold of these but still if you want to take on the ride then i would suggest to take the higher road the road of options where the amount lost on a trade is limited whereas the potential to earn is unlimited be it the budget or monetary policy banks have a significant role to play in that announcement so if you see banks suffering during that phase then chances are that the announcement would grant them certain relief some benefit so you could buy a call option of the nifty bank index if you and the majority of analysts on the tv which often represent the voice of general market sentiment feel that banks need to be tightened up and the announcement would resemble it then you could short the nifty bank index via put option The reason why I prefer options more than buying stocks when engaging in speculation is that it keeps us prepared. You know what you have staked and can afford to lose whereas buying stocks keeps you hanging in the turmoil of your sentiments where you try to justify your mistake and hold with the hope to recover losing more in the process. Besides, why would you buy a stock with a significant amount when you know that you won't be staying in that trade for more than a week? In this case, options seem to be a better deal because the reward for the risk is comparatively better than buying stocks. Also, not all the time will it be a situation of throwing random darts in the market. Often things do happen which the market expects. and with sufficient experience you can place safer and more accurate bets it would all depend on the individual and his knowledge about things like politics economy and the law of demand and supply with this we end our chapter on political slash budget multibaggers chapter 23 hyped multibaggers quote do you know who defines the definition of rich the rich do you know who defines the definition of poor the rich unquote by kalpesh suryavanshi in earlier chapters we discussed companies that turn multibaggers due to a certain theme or due to a specific trend in that industry but the multibagger which we shall be seeing here won't be so due to any theme or industry play out but due to a certain buzz in the market but unlike previous cases where a group of companies got affected here only an individual company gets affected there is no substantial reason for it turning multibagger and maybe sometimes there is you just can't figure it out to simplify it just consider the case of people who get famous overnight 
Some become so due to their effort, while some just are there. Similar are the hyped multibaggers, whose duration of multibagging ranges from a week to often a year, but not more. Today, due to the restrictions imposed and the kind of lifestyle we live, the average person now spends around five hours of his day online. It could be because of work, study, entertainment, etc. Since we spend most of our time online, companies that know this sell us their products on these platforms. No matter where you go online, consciously or unconsciously, you are getting influenced by their advertisements. We have reached a stage where we have people who call themselves proudly as influencers. From the food we eat, to the dress we should wear, or the slangs we should use, or the movies we should watch, all is told to us by them. We value their opinion more than our own judgment and we willingly submit to their word. Look how lower we have fallen. Even the quality of our inspirations, our heroes, have degraded. When a salesman who work hard in the sun to earn his living knocks on our door, we look down upon him and don't even give our ears to what he has to say. On the other hand, the salesman on social media who calls himself as influencer sells you some mediocre crap stating that he uses it and would recommend and you buy. It is so easy to deceive you. People don't listen to what is being said. They see who is saying it. They trust authority more than the facts. We don't want to use our brain. Nobody likes it. Like children, we like to be spoon-fed with ideas, thoughts and actions. All the companies know this. Your influencers understand this. Your heroes make money out of this and in no time this act of theirs which they call advertising slash marketing becomes a trend and like sheeps we follow this buzz. Without going into the depth, without using our own intellect, we submit and lose our individuality. Most of us, if not all, want to mark our impression in this world. But how can we? You do what they do. You see what they show. You read what they want you to read. It is self-contradictory. How can you be different by being the same as that of the crowd? There is a problem because of this global ignorance. But there are also people who rebel, who take advantage of this folly. But historically, we have seen stupidity prevail even though for a short period of time. Ignorance rules. And the case which we are about to discuss in this chapter is the same case. Where ignorance takes over and for a while idiots rule. This is our case of hyped multibaggers. It is the time when the second wave of COVID-19 began in February 2021. The cases of coronavirus were increasing at a rapid pace and the nation was under pressure to tackle the situation. Due to mismanagement or irresponsibility of the government, whatever you want to call it, led to shortage of several medical necessities like injections, ventilators, etc. The hospitals and medical stores were not having enough medical supply which caused trouble to patients suffering as well as their family some of which even died because of it. As the time passed by, companies which were producing or manufacturing these medical necessities started receiving lots of orders, often beyond their capacity. Most investors thought of this adversity as an opportunity to capitalize and started investing in the shares related to pharmaceuticals, as we saw in the case of industrial multibaggers. As said in earlier chapters, the stocks of pharma companies started blowing up and people rushed towards this money-making opportunity. They saw or read the news, got influenced by social media influencers and bought stocks which they got recommended. In this frenzy, there was this company named Bombay Oxygen Investments whose stock rose up 140% in just one month from March 25th to its high of April 15th. The reason for this multibagger return in such a short period of time was the name of the company Bombay Oxygen. 
Since at that time the oxygen supply to hospitals all over the nation was low, people expected these oxygen manufacturing and supply companies to gain, which made them buy these stocks. But after touching its high, the stock of Bombay Oxygen got stuck in lower circuits day after day. So, what happened? Did the company go bankrupt or did it get too valued? Well, the reason is far difficult to believe. because this is our case of hyped multibagger you see due to the hype of oxygen shortage almost all companies engaged in that business saw their stocks gaining but the case of bombay oxygen was quite different its stock rose because the company had oxygen in its name but in reality it neither produced nor supplied any oxygen it had no relation whatsoever with oxygen In the past it had its business of manufacturing and supplying industrial gases which it had stopped by August 2019. So its name remained the same while its current business activity was that of a holding company which makes financial investments in shares mutual funds and other similar assets. Therefore due to the ignorance and the hype in the market this stock more than doubled itself in just a matter of 30 days. only because it had oxygen in its name similar thing was witnessed in the american market a few months ago with a stock named gamestop to tell about it in brief the company of gamestop was engaged in the business of selling video games and consumer electronics which they carried out through traditional brick and mortar stores which in the world of internet was outdated and the company was considered to be doomed Since the company was failing many hedge funds had shorted its stock to benefit from the destruction at the same time there were certain users of reddit which is a popular forum on the internet who believed that the stock of gamestop was undervalued and gave their reasons for its revival and within a few weeks the stock of gamestop showed signs of recovery this was just a beginning and it got more people interested into the stock more and more people got into buying this company there were memes subreddits social media influencers all encouraging their supporters to buy this stock over time this was perceived as a battle between the institutions and the individuals the battle between the hedge funds versus retail investors in just 15 days stock of gamestop had given a return of 1500% which resulted in a huge loss to the hedge funds according to some sources the hedge funds had faced a loss of 19.75 billion dollars also what goes up must come down and so did the stock of gamestop which again led other retail investors to suffer loss in the process This is what happens when people start using an investment vehicle as a form of casino. You might win for a while, but the end result will be nothing but a great tragedy. As we see from the above two cases, there is no benefit whatsoever when buying these hyped multibaggers. By giving their descriptions and their examples, all I can teach you is to identify them and protect yourself from participating in such a frenzy. Another name you could give these is meme multibaggers. They are there just to mock the system. When you see a stock rising aggressively, when you see the influencers pushing it, when you see the news covering it, and when nobody seems to understand the reasons behind its meteoric rise, then what you are looking at is nothing but a hyped multibagger. But if speculation is what you love and taking risk is your nature, then the best possible thing to do in these cases is to short buy puts when you feel it is about to end be one of those party poppers let them enjoy for a while but when they will cry you will smile the world on the internet we see is nothing but the reflection of our real world here too you'll find the good and the bad it is up to you what you choose to see what you decide to be let no one manipulate you not even in your dreams take charge of your thoughts and learn to accept the responsibility of your actions there should be a reason why you invest its answer should be beyond money if by investing it saves you some time time to do what you love then invest 
If by investing it teaches you a skill, a skill which you can use in your life, then invest. There are thousand ways to earn money, safer and better to earn a living. But if you choose investing to serve that purpose, do it as an art more than a business. Use it to express yourself, to contribute in this world, not as a means to achieve, but as a way to give. There will come people who will tell you to worship money, but don't fall for their trap. They want you to be enslaved, chained in their world. Respect the money, but don't worship it. Hustle, not for the numbers in your bank account, but for the love of your family. Those who judge you based on the followers you have, the car you drive or the clothes you wear are not worth living with. Because they love your car, not you. Your house, not you. Your fame, not you. Pretentious are they. Fake are their promises. Spend your life gaining something which cannot be stripped of your body, stolen from your bank account or your house. Strive to build a character which is worth sacrificing your life for. All these hypes, these trends and the people you follow these shall all fade away. Let alone your actions be such so as to be long-lasting. Let your impact in this world be eternal. Live like an immortal amongst these mortals. With this then, I end my few words of inspiration and we shall meet in our next chapter. Chapter 24 Inverse Multibaggers Quote How you spend your money is more important than how much you make. Unquote by Kalpesh Suryavanshi in this chapter, we shall discuss and see multibaggers that aren't much popular and perhaps not even heard of. The sole reason for their existence is that they aren't mainstream and blossom only on the rare occasions. Earlier we saw that people are sheeps and so are certain stocks which gain popularity due to a certain hype like that of hyped multibaggers while we also saw demand-supply multibagger, which are slightly different than the hyped. You see, not all demand-supply multibaggers are the cause of hype, whereas all the hyped multibaggers are structurally demand-supply multibaggers. And we have collective multibaggers that rise in a particular industry, which we called the industrial multibaggers, while we had individual companies which succeeded by betting on a theme in trend which we refer to as the thematic multibagger. But what we are about to see is the opposite of all these. The inverse multibagger is like a rebel who doesn't go with the flow but against it. It does not follow the trend but cuts through it. When the market is falling, it rises and when the market rises, it may fall. There will be numerous examples which will belong to this category of individual multibaggers and all of them will have a distinct quality which will separate them from each other. But fundamentally, they'll all remain the same, the inverse multibaggers. Let us begin with the simplest and a well-known commodity slash metal as an example, gold. Gold is one of the precious metals which has no value of its own. It cannot be sowed to grow more, can't be eaten or drank. If you keep it in a safe, it won't multiply or divide. Just a piece of metal which glitters but people still value it and often spend their savings to buy it which makes gold also a demand supply multibagger. That is, it grows in price based on the mechanism of demand and supply regardless of its value. Anyhow, gold is also an inverse multibagger and it's been so for a while. Actually, all inverse multibaggers are short-termed and their inverse nature is always proportional to something. Because you always need something to be inverse with, you cannot contradict with nothing. So, gold during the period of financial crisis or economic pessimism turns up as an inverse multibagger. You can look out in history, for instance. Whenever the market shows a downtrend due to reasons like war, crisis, calamity, etc., then gold rises higher. 
As we know, the price of gold is dependent on the law of demand and supply, and when the events like crisis, war, calamity, etc. occur, then people in the stock market start losing faith in the businesses, economy, or sometimes even in the country. So, they pull out their wealth from the stock market and start buying gold because gold is regarded as universal currency. And if something bad happens to your country or its economy, then the wealth which you have hoarded in the form of currency becomes risky. In that instance, then gold comes to the rescue as it can be used to buy slash sell things in the worst of worst times. Objectively, gold has no value. But when we all universally decide that it should have value, then it automatically gains it. So, gold becomes a safer bet during periods of uncertainty like war or crisis. Of course, if things start improving and people start seeing the signs of betterment, then gold loses its momentum and takes its casual pace. This way, you have only a limited period to catch and stay with this inverse multibagger. Same is the case with bonds, which are fixed instruments of income. Although bonds don't fit our definition of multibagger, it only is an example of an asset which shows inverse relation to the market in times of crisis. Also, when the market crashes and businesses seem to fail or lack growth, then there are businesses that benefit from these situations. Like, the credit rating agencies get more projects or contracts to deal when the whole market is in turmoil. Sometimes, businesses themselves employ these credit rating checks to assure their bondholders, banks, shareholders, etc. This may not always be the case. So just don't go out and buy the credit rating agencies when the market tumbles. Wait. Analyze the situation and then strike the best possible option. Since during crisis uncertainty is rising and people are demanding for gold, then companies that have gold reserves like dwellers or gold financing companies etc. are also expected to benefit. If you want to go deeper in this matter, then you can even look for companies that mine the gold cause they are the ones who truly fulfill the demand of gold in the market. This was also one of the major reasons why Warren Buffett, the greatest investor of our time, bought the gold mining company of America, that is Barrick Gold Corp, during the initial days of pandemic. Perhaps at that time he feared that pandemic could worsen the economic balance and people will look for gold. Since he has an abundance of capital, instead of buying gold, he simply bought the company that mines gold, which is easier to sell if things seem to get back on track again. Second is the way of speculation. During the period of crisis, along with gold, there are certain commodities that also rise, which most often are agricultural commodities like wheat, sugar, seeds, etc. The reason why they rise is that they are essentials and people tend to buy more when the future seems uncertain, just like the ants which create a food surplus for them before the winter strikes. Also, retail or FMCG companies that sell essential and day-to-day -day products also have a chance of turning multibaggers during the crisis. People will need food, veggies, groceries, clothes, no matter what happens. So you could find inverse multibaggers here as well. And the things which we are seeing now, where certain industries are moving inversely to the direction of the market, the information and technology companies, pharmaceuticals, etc. are two industries which are rising despite the market overall falling. So you have a chance of finding inverse multibaggers there as well. Another example of inverse multibaggers are the multinational IT companies which rise when the Indian rupee falls against the dollar. It is because they export their services in exchange for dollars and the rise of the dollar gives them a benefit to spend it more effectively in their own country where rupee is cheap. To some extent, this also happens with companies that export oil or gases, but is quite rare since the trade of export isn't at that great level which it should be for a company to turn multibagger. I hope then, by now, you have learned the way of thinking. 
a new perspective to look at the companies and businesses so as to find miracles in the business world by yourself which is our ultimate goal in the study of multibaggers chapter 25 new venture multibaggers quote no matter how hard you try or control things will always happen in their course as they were meant to be planning is good but spontaneity is better unquote by kalpesh suryavanshi all businesses start with an idea a concept which leads them to stardom in the business world but we also know that in this world nothing but change is constant the businesses all have their heydays and maydays which are referred to as the business cycles it is a story of growth and decay businesses grow dominate reach their peaks which is followed up by a saturation point and the business that is unable to go beyond this phase loses its charm eventually dying out and some new business take over and this cycle continues but there also are businesses that refuse to give up they go beyond the saturation point by launching a new service or a product they keep experimenting and innovating new ideas and bringing them to reality which in this case we call as the new venture when a company which has reached its saturation point decides to take up a new business activity in order to keep itself growing we call it our new venture multibagger just like in nature everything around us keeps evolving as a species in order to survive via means of natural selection so do businesses struggle whose management is ambitious and doesn't want to quit that is where we have a chance of finding a new venture multibagger the major problem is that this process ain't easy just like evolution is not easy many species that is in our case businesses die out trying to evolve because they are not fit enough according to the business environment so the struggle of survival ain't easy no matter who you are or where you are take an example of the company called kodak the company that sold photo and videography products which revolutionized the industry by making the cameras available to every household at affordable rates the company used to sell its cameras and equipment for a low margin since it was the pre digital era people needed reels and printing sheets to actualize their images which kodak sold at higher margins so the one time product camera was cheap while the regular accessories to keep the camera functioning were priced highly this made them a fortune it is similar to what companies like hp brother toshiba etc do to earn revenue they sell printers at minimal profit while its inks and cartridges at higher rates which gives them a stable stream of revenue By the 1980s the photography industry was going through a paradigm shift the age of digital cameras that required no reels or sheets when other companies started selling these digital cameras kodak was still stuck with its analog cameras for its revenue over time the company realized its mistake but by then it was too late and other businesses had taken over In order to survive Kodak also started a new venture of selling expensive printers and its ink cheaper while other businesses were playing the opposite game they were selling printers cheap and ink expensive after the struggle of decades the company Kodak that once dominated the market filed and declared itself bankrupt in the year 2012 By now you must have understood how important timing is when starting a new venture and how crucial is the role of decisions of management in this process Not all businesses that strive to take up a new venture succeed It is like giving birth to a newborn baby where the mortality rate is too high But if all things go well then you can see examples like that of Tesla 
you can see transformations like that of Amazon and can see metamorphosis like that of our India's giant reliance industries. Most often, when companies decide to start a new venture is when they see lack of growth or see a saturation in their current business activity. They are either struggling like Kodak or searching for more growth like Reliance. Therefore, when a company which is struggling decides to start a new venture, and if it succeeds, then it is a new venture multibagger as well as the recovery multibagger. But if a company which is doing well but still starts up a new venture, not as a means to survive but for growth, then it is only a new venture multibagger. And your best chances are with the companies which are choosing new ventures for growth and not as a means to survive. Also, we cannot find a pure case of new venture multibaggers because often there are more than one reasons for a company to turn multibagger. There are lots of things going on in their business. They might tie up, merge or acquire, take up more capital for growth and reduce debt to reaffirm ratings, etc. With experience then, one should be able to recognize all these factors and be able to connect the dots accurately. If you can do this earlier than the overall market, if you develop that sense of being able to predict the future based on the data you have, then you may one day turn into a renowned multi-baggerer. It is a skill which needs to be mastered and only with practice shall you be confident in your approach. Yet, be careful. If a company that sells petrol all of a sudden decides to manufacture and sell mobiles. Be careful if the company that sells cars starts making rockets. It is not a negative sign, but just be careful if the new venture of the company is such that it has no prior experience in it and is completely outside the scope of its current business activity. It is like a person who studies medicine throughout his college and later decides to be a lawyer, which isn't wrong fundamentally, but is just wasteful of his previous efforts and the time. Just like some people who can undergo this transformation, so are the businesses which can flip themselves completely without much difficulty. Since the market is huge and the businesses are numerous, we cannot keep on discussing each individual case which will unnecessarily elongate the content of the book. Let us then stick with the basics and see things which one must keep in mind when looking for a new venture multibagger. Number 1. Look for the reason. Why do you think the company is starting this new venture? Is it for survival or to explore further growth opportunities? If the answer is growth, then move on to the next point. Number 2. Is it practical? There are often business ideas and ventures that sound great in theory but fail to make a similar impact in reality. If you feel the business venture is practical, then try to estimate its scalability. How much time and capital will it need to be actualized? And does the company which is planning to do so has enough capital to make it or at least has ways to raise enough capital? Number 3. Industry Analysis If a business is starting up the new venture, then in what industry is it looking for? What is the current trend and challenges in that industry? What about the competitors and the average survival rate in that industry? In totality, one needs to find answers to such questions. It is a new venture, so there won't be a roadmap, which is why the above points were filled with questions rather than answers. When there is uncertainty, then you don't need answers first, but questions. And the right kind of questions. Questions that lead you towards a direction instead of circling you at one place. So, to be successful in the art of finding new venture multibaggers, you also need to learn the skill of intelligent questioning. It will be the questions which will show you the direction, while the answers will lead you on the path. Chapter 26 Rivalry Multibaggers Quote 
money gives you the power to buy time someone else's time unquote by kalpesh suryavanshi until now we saw that being in a competitive environment is bad for the businesses we saw that businesses that have a greater market share or a monopoly they have a greater chance of being multibaggers what we forgot is that monopolies are not gifted strong market share isn't effortless it is all a developed state it is a stage when the battle gets over the weaker fails and the stronger dominates competition of course in some industries is deadly to both sides but it is also that competition which gives birth to innovation quality cheaper prices and expansion so if there is a healthy form of competition then not only the consumer of industry benefits but also the businesses engaged in it we belong to the generation who has lived and witnessed one of the biggest corporate rivalries in india the battle between the two brothers belonging to india's richest family the ambanis from their formal split in 2006 we can see how both the brothers managed their fortunes one took it as granted while the other took it to even greater heights we can see how reliance communication in bracket anil ambani's half bracket close grew extraordinarily from june 2006 to january 2008 during that period the stock of rcom had more than doubled but it could not maintain the momentum of that trajectory and due to mismanagement and also other external reasons like that of the global housing crisis somehow anil ambani failed to keep up his fame and his business today the stock of arcom trades less than 2 rupees slowly and steadily decomposing itself on the other hand the elder brother mukesh ambani has taken his company to a new height and ranks 8th in the list of world's richest people since every coin has two sides we also have another example of a competition slash rivalry that turned healthy for both oppositions It all began in the late 90s when Tata Motors had decided to enter into the market of passenger vehicles for which they launched a new car called Indisis which didn't become a big hit and Tata had to face huge losses There was a certain section of people who told Tata to sell his unit which he accepted and decided to meet Bill Ford the chairman of Ford company at that time Mr Tata proposed to sell him his unit of passenger vehicles for which he faced humiliation and got tensed somehow the deal was cancelled years passed and by 2008 tata motors had made big in the indian car market while the company ford its competitor was struggling hard to survive tata took this as an opportunity which he called as sweet revenge in an interview He offered Bill Ford to buy the Ford's two luxury brands that is Jaguar and Land Rover for which the man who once humiliated Tata felt grateful for his favor. Over the period of time JDR today contributes to major sales for Tata outside India and is at a new height. Therefore competition in certain cases is a healthy thing. It allows businesses to think outside of the box and grow together. In America we have the case of Apple versus Microsoft. Both the companies once had a feud and perhaps it still continues to some extent. It was the time of judgment for even the customers where they showed loyalty towards their favorite company by buying and supporting its products. Both the companies focused on personal computers and challenged each other at various events by making new innovations and developments which the opposite company used as a step to rise higher. This competition not only gave us new inventions but also history's biggest multibaggers. The year was 1977 when both these rival companies agreed upon a mutual settlement where Microsoft started to provide support of MS Office to all Mac devices while Apple agreed to make Internet Explorer as its default browser. 
Over time, they have worked together at various instances, giving better services to their clients and helping each other in their respective journeys. Although they are rivals, with healthy competition, they turn the businesses around and are today in the list of trillion-dollar businesses. As an explorer of multibaggers, one should not shy away from these stories of these rivalries, but should get interested and learn. These stories tell you that there is no growth without failure, no friendship without enmity, and no multibagger without rivalry. There is a saying, in quotes, when cats fight, the monkey benefits, unquote, which is derived from a story where two kittens find a piece of cake and start fighting between themselves for the equal share. From a distance, a monkey sees this cat fight and decides to mediate into the matter. He cuts the piece of cake into two halves, but one half turns out to be larger. So he takes a bite to make it equal to the other. But he bites a greater chunk and the other part appears larger. So he takes another bite to make it small and this way he keeps eating the cake until nothing is left for both the two. Such are also instances which we shall see in the business world, where two mighty companies fight for a greater market share, depleting their sources in the battle while the other may benefit. We saw this case in the Reliance Geo battle. Earlier, telecom companies like Kittens fought with each other on tariff prices, network quality and expansion in order to gain a larger market share. But in 2015, Reliance entered the scene like the monkey who eventually eats up all the cake. Geo today has the highest market share in the telecom industry of 40% and is also the most profitable company in that same industry while others are struggling with their debt and declining market share. One must understand then that if you want to be a part of rivalry multibagger, then learn to identify the qualities of a strong business. For any company to take over its rival, it should have an abundance of cash or network to raise such capital. However, the rivalry should be healthy and not against the brands of each other. No mockery of opposition's products, which is derogatory in nature. If you see signs which are the signs of healthy competition, then participate. Try to choose the side of the one whom you feel is mighty and is well equipped for the situation. If you can't look through the eyes of an investor, then look with the eyes of the consumer. As a consumer, whose side would you like to be? Whose product are you in love with? Also, the rivalry multibaggers will be short-term in nature. A phase of huge volatility in the stocks of rival companies which will also give you an opportunity to find value. And during this period of the rivalry, the company that wins shall see its stock rising inversely proportional to the fall of the failing company. So far, I can only discuss the generality and thus do not go by my words. Sometimes there are exceptions where the things I have stated may not work. In that case, your common sense alone will be your friend. I guess this then is our last chapter on the various kinds of multibaggers. Now that you know the basic structure and the nomenclature of multibaggers, one is now equipped to find his own set of multibaggers, your own flavors. Don't be restricted to only my sets, but keep the study of multibaggers extending, where we all keep adding new discoveries to this subject. Let us make this an art essential for all, the art rewarding for all who want to succeed in their financial journeys. In the upcoming chapters, we shall discuss other important aspects of investing in the stock market and some parting words of wisdom. Thank you for staying with me so far in the journey and we shall meet in the next chapter. Chapter 27 The Role of Management Analysis Quote We Indians are hard-working but risk-averse, which is why we are the CEOs of multi-billion dollar companies instead of owning them. Unquote, 
by Kalpesh Suryavanshi. Welcome readers to the core of our study. So far, we learnt the art of thinking. With examples, with cases, I wanted you to see the world through the lens of my mind. However, I was also careful to not feed you thoughts or give you formulas which would spoil all my efforts. My whole aim was not to give you thoughts or teach you rigid concepts, but a way to think, a way to analyze and make decisions based on one's own sense. Most literature on investing out there is rigid. It closes the windows of your mind by giving you straight answers, allowing no growth on your part, which is why the schools and colleges fail. They end our curiosity by giving away the answers, leaving no room for our imagination. I ask you, would you travel on a bullock cart when the world is using trains? Would you crawl when the people around you are flying? Would you bring sticks and stones when the war needs to be fought with guns and bullets? Perhaps not, because we know these things are outdated and just so we don't lag behind. We should use tech which the world is using. Similarly are the concepts taught in your textbooks, your courses of MBA. They lack updation. If you look at the businesses, they are evolving rapidly. Accounting standards get changed. The means of valuing the companies change. The technology used in businesses changed. 90% of the books published on business and management get outdated the year after they are published. Instead of reading a hundred books on business management, just see the world around you. What we often forget is that the writer or the author of that book has done so by learning from the world he lives in. He is no different from you except for the difference that he sees by being awake, while you just sleepwalk. And then you need books to find an answer to your problems. Certainly some books are helpful. They let you learn from an experience which you can never afford to be in, but their number is pretty darn low. Read, not hundreds, but only tens of books throughout your life which don't give you thoughts or teach concepts, but teach you a method of thinking, a lens to see the world. I don't know how successful I've been in my endeavor, but if you can find multibaggers by yourself, if you can clear certain doubts by yourself, then I would term it success. I understand there will be flaws in my book, some voids which will raise a doubt in your mind. But if you can pass through and solve those problems, then you are not only helping yourself, but also contributing in this study of multibaggers. Moving on then to the importance of management analysis when investing in a company. There absolutely is no doubt that the management plays a key role in the operations of the business. They are the reasons for its failure as well as its success. They are like the crew of the ships while the CEO is its captain. And when we buy a stock or shares of a particular company, we are being its shareholder partner in its journey of success or failure. So, just like it is unwise to board a ship without knowing its destination, its route and the experience of its captain, so is it when investing in a company without knowing its business goals, aspirations and the qualities of management. By investing, we are handing over a hard-earned money to that management who promises to invest it wisely for which you will get a return over the period of time via means of dividend, bonus, etc. This is why some people say that the stock market is more about making an investment in people than in their ideas. It is more about qualitative analysis than it is about quantitative analysis. Also, there is already an abundance of literature on analyzing people and making judgments about their character. So, I don't want to repeat all that study here, but rather tell you some of its limitations. To make it clear again, 
I certainly believe that management analysis plays an important role in investing, but from the perspective of a retail investor, I feel it is overrated. Since my book is written with the perspective of a retail investor and in order to help the retail investor, I want you to know that we as individuals have our weakness which also is our strength. And all I want you is to acknowledge it and see how things start getting easier. First of all, we as retail investors never buy a controlling stake in any company and if you are wanting to buy a controlling stake, then you might skip the chapter and spend your time doing management analysis more than quantitative analysis. The sole reason for this is that when you buy a controlling stake in a business, you get to deal with management. You can have a say in their decisions and sometimes even influence it. Therefore, people who buy a controlling stake need to analyze the management. They need people who might cooperate, who might resonate with their vision, who are honest and transparent. The person Buying a controlling stake needs to see all this because it is not easy to buy that controlling stake nor is it easy to sell that controlling stake. One needs to find a seller slash buyer who is willing to carry out such a transaction. Sometimes people who buy a controlling stake do so by buying it from the management itself and during their exit, they often even sell it back to the management or some person in the management. It takes weeks and even months for them to carry out such transactions successfully and a good management makes this process easier. One can carry out any task easily with people whom he believes and when their thoughts or ambitions match each other, which is why you see the great investors keep talking and praising the managements of the companies they have invested in, it is an act of reciprocity. On the other hand, the retail investor is limited by the capital in his hand, which is too small even to buy a 0.01% stake in a company. But it also is his strength. Since we are buying a very small proportion of that market cap, we don't need to worry about buying or selling it. One moment you have those shares and another you don't. With technology, you can sell or buy these pieces of partnership in just a few clicks. This is a boon which gives us enormous amounts of freedom when allocating our capital. You can get stake in small, large or largest businesses without worrying who to buy or whom to sell. No problem of legal contracts, no official meetings, nothing and yet you'll earn the same percentage in which the great investors are making. It should also tell you that the amount of time taken to decide whether to invest or not, exit or not, is shorter for the retail investor, whereas more capital you have, more time it will take to complete the deal or to square off the trade. If you get a chance, you can ask any fund manager on how difficult it is for him to complete his trade or to finalize his decisions just because the size of capital he manages. Every quarter he has to give the unit holders the report about their portfolio, its progress, so he has to keep hustling, struggling to find opportunities which often may lead to bad decisions. He can't let the capital just sit around. His job is to keep that money moving. That alone is his goal. In a way then, you as retail investors are lucky. Your problems are as small as the amount of money you hold in hand. If you see no opportunity, you can keep it in your bank, bonds, gold, house or even spend it. But the managers and the great investors aren't in that position. For them, their capital in cash is a liability since it is losing its value due to the inflation. They are in a competitive environment. They have a reputation to maintain. Another reason for retail investors to spend less time doing qualitative analysis is the drawback of not being able to see the complete picture. Just think for a while. What sources do we have to know about the management? 
we have their statements in annual reports which are well scripted and thought of so as to maintain investor confidence and attract more money after all an annual report is nothing more than a sales document used by management to attract more capital for its business we have interviews with a ceo or some significant person in the company but then again it is rare the ceos or businessmen we see in interviews are only the ones who have already achieved big and if you are about to invest in a new company which has just started its venture then you may have difficulty finding their interview besides interviews of the management are not very enlightening most are done with prepared questions as well as the answers they start with a goal and end with a conclusion rarely will you get to see the true side of a person in an interview because he knows he is on a public platform he knows he'll be seen by hundreds of people and so he tries to be responsible he acts diplomatic so as to avoid getting into controversy of course there will be exceptions people who don't give a damn about others opinions and be who they are but the business world has very few people like that because they have some rules to follow as given by sebi they have their bosses to impress and investors to keep them optimists we then have meetings conferences where the management discusses the business and its future which again is just a rule which must follow by reading a pre-planned speech which rarely gives you any idea of the management's motive so are the interviews annual reports or conferences done by the management invaluable i would say no they certainly provide us some value but not enough to place our decisions upon you see we all have our own way of looking at things sometimes we spend years with a person we live we eat and we even sleep together but still fail to truly understand that person we just don't see how the person which we thought we knew suddenly turns unknown things stop working and we separate this happens with our partner friends relatives and often with our family the reason is people are complex because their minds are complex we may say one thing now but state the opposite later we may believe something now but condemn it tomorrow so judging a person based on his momentary appearance via meetings conferences etc isn't a right thing to do also there are people who are hypocritical who say one thing and do another therefore the ultimate test of management is not their words but their actions not the promises they make but the promises they fulfill and the business they are running is the ultimate evidence of it we are retail investors we can never see the true side of the management but that should not stop you from knowing the truth if you want to know the management talk with the investor relations department and see how they treat small investors like you ask for small favors like getting a hard copy of the annual report dispatched to your house use the company's product or service because it is the sole representative of the management's efforts go out and meet the dealers or distributors who see the company's product ask them how they feel about the sales person who deals with them how does the company cooperate with them sometimes try calling the customer support regarding the company's product or service how does it treat your query does it solve it satisfactorily if you get a chance see the company culture by signing up for the interview or by visiting sites like glassdoor where employees leave their reviews about the work culture pros and cons of working in that company you see it is very easy to win over people with flowery words and by giving them fake promises with a mix of flattery and over time some people become masters of this art in which case their actions tell you who they truly are rather than their words so just to keep yourself safe from such injustices 
I suggest using the indirect means of management analysis more than the direct ways of their interviews or conferences. Besides, retail investors need not know about them in depth or their biography of sorts since we won't be dealing with them day to day. Focus your energy more on the quantitative aspects of the business, its balance sheet and its future cash flows. In a way, the management of a company is important to tell you things about where it sees the company in the next few years or how it plans to solve the current problems faced by the business. This gives us some relief and a sort of direction about the business, but ultimately it is the numbers which give life to the promises, their stories. Sometimes just by looking at the numbers in an annual report one can deduce the things on which management is lying or giving away unrealistic hope but hope is good only to the extent where it aligns with the reality otherwise it may lead you to destruction and decay which one should carefully avoid when investing now that you know i also want you to understand a few things one is that we are all flawed We all have our imperfections and we all make mistakes. It is how we grow. If we were perfect, we wouldn't be living but dead, since perfection is a state where there is no more growth, no improvement. Mistakes, failures, imperfections are the signs that we are alive. We are breathing. Just like it is with happiness, when we are happy or blissful, we lose the sense of time it just flies by and we don't know whether we are alive or in the dreamland but in pain we know that we are truly alive in pain time slows down and we can feel every moment passing by so it is good to make mistakes just don't repeat the same mistake twice once it is a mistake but repeat it and that's stupidity accept that we cannot know all things and there will always be things that will remain unknown and beyond our control you may analyze the company you might know it will grow at a certain rate per year and by the age of 30 you might become a millionaire you can make precise assumptions and calculations but who knows you'll even survive till 30 who knows whether the company may not go bankrupt during that period or the promoter may flee the country anything and everything could happen and if you become a control freak trying to overpower nature then life will become nothing but difficult hence try to maintain a similar attitude even when investing sometimes you'll have to leave things on fate or luck sometimes you'll have to trust the management in the worst you'll have to hope for the best this will not only keep your mind free from unnecessary worries but also will add a boost to your health which is more important than your wealth all this hassle about investments these tools about qualitative analysis quantitative analysis use them to make your life simpler rather than complex all the study all this time you spent on learning these things do it to get free from the clutches of financial demons don't entangle yourself in the pursuit the problem with most people who make investments in the stock market is that they are too afraid to admit their mistake and fail to book a loss early on knowing that it might increase in future there is a profound quote by aubrey de graf that says in quotes don't cling to a mistake just because you spent a lot of time making it unquote which sums up the whole situation and its solution people fail to accept the truth that things can go wrong their judgments and assumptions may be flawed and should then sell the stock once you realize it better to lose a dollar than to lose our complete savings this will save you from lots of psychological mess it happens sometimes that we start identifying ourselves with our decisions and even when we see them failing we still cling to them just because we are invested in it and spend our life living with it 
This is how people keep on continuing in toxic relationships. Cynical partners. This attitude is destructive and should be unwelcomed if you want to be a successful investor. We saw throughout our book that people change, their thoughts change, their aspirations change, and so will the business is that they run. If you see something early on which is against your principle, your expectations then sell the stock. Like the investors that have a significant stake, you don't have that problem. Just a second and the stocks will be out of your trading accounts. So, whether you want to buy or sell the stocks, you are free. Freer than the joint investors and more flexible when it comes to capital allocation. This is why in the beginning I discussed that one should have a target, a goal before entering in a transaction. When you know the destination pre-planned, you can board the right bus and see if it is going on the road or changing the route. The companies are no different than that. They have to adjust with the demand of the time, the competitors and their customers. No company will adjust according to the expectations of its retail investors. We don't have much say. The promoters having a ruling stake can do so, but we as retail investors have only two choices, either to sell or hold. I would now like to end this chapter by telling you my personal experience and why one shouldn't use only management as a deciding factor when investing, but also see other aspects. It was in the year 2018 when I was still a beginner in the world of stock market and had just been through my phase of beginner's luck where I had doubled my investment of 10k to 20k in just a few months. Anyhow, this gave me confidence and I asked my dad for more money so I could invest and multiply them. At that time, I was completely novice didn't understand balance sheets nor had any sense of business. I was merely a speculator. On my request, my dad gave me 10k. Now, deep down, I knew that my profits were a product of luck and not effort. So this time, I chose the company which I felt was the safest. The company that belonged to the man I could trust by money with since I knew a lot about him from the books of history and also had seen some of his interviews. He was none other than Mr. Ratan Tata and the company I chose to put those 10k was the Tata Group Company, Tata Motors. From the peak of 2016, the stock of Tata Motors was already down by almost 50% in 2018 at near rupees 320. I, being the idiot I was, thought that it was a Tata Group company and would never fail due to the giants handling it and there is no need to tell how transparent and ethical Tata is in running their business. So, I felt my investment was in the right company without looking at anything other than the brand Tata. From 2018 to 2019, from Rs 320 per share to 120 in 2019. The stock declined by more than 50% and so my amount from 10k had become 5k. Left with no other choice since I feared it could go down more, I sold it, booking a loss of 50% on my investment. This also became a turning point since I started learning and growing after that incident, but not once after that have I made an investment solely by looking at the management or the CEO alone. Even today, when I look at my business opportunity, I assume that I am dealing with criminals and that anything on public platforms or the balance sheet could be tampered and so I try to find businesses which prove their worth not via its CEO or the annual reports but by the demand it creates in the market, by the value it provides in the life of its customers. Surely numbers don't lie but the management can by tampering those numbers and so be very careful when you look at those. It isn't that I believe all businessmen in the market are criminals, deceptive or frauds. 
I still have great respect for Mr. Tata, by the way, and the loss I suffered was my fault, not his or the management's, since they have no control over the company's stock prices. But by giving that example, I wanted to convey that things can go wrong, and even the greatest businessman in history can fall. It is cyclic. One business goes, another rises. Therefore, by maintaining a skeptic point of view, I simply embrace the possibility that things could get vastly wrong. And as an investor, the responsibility of my loss slash profit lays only in my hand and not that of the management or the business. A retail investor cannot expect more. We just have to learn to take the responsibility of the transactions we carry out and leave certain things to luck. Fate, or whatever you want to call it. So with this conclusion, then we shall end our chapter. Take the content of this chapter as an opinion amongst the opinions. I know sometimes I go against the mainstream wisdom which some may admire while some disdain. Those who think it as wisdom can learn. Those who think of it as stupidity can still learn. Either way, my thoughts shall help you grow. Things that seem to work, you can do them more, while the things that don't, do them less. Chapter 28 Valuation and Multibaggers Quote People who have a proficient grasp over history also tend to have a great sense of the future. Unquote by Kalpesh Suryavanshi. Throughout the book, I use this word value, presuming that you as a reader know what it means. I also didn't feel any need to specifically define that word since the multibaggers we saw rarely needed this discussion to be brought up, but since this is the end, I can do nothing but clear the fog which should give a whole new perspective of looking at things. There is a renowned concept popularized by Mr. Warren Buffett called value investing, which implies that all investing is value investing. That is, when you buy an asset for a price more than it really is worth, you have carried out value investing. But the question is, who shall decide the worth? Its value. Suppose you are in a desert, thirsty, nearly death due to lack of water, and you see a man carrying a packaged water bottle that has a price of rupees 20. You know that if you fail to buy that bottle from him, then you would die since none is around to help you out. And the man on the side also knows that you need that bottle badly, which he sees as an opportunity to make money. So, he certainly is not going to give his water bottle to you at the marked price. Now, it is up to you to decide how much your life is worth to you. How much would you pay him to save your life? Depending on the money in your wallet, you could perhaps start by giving him 100 rupees, which is five times more than the actual price. If the bargain continues, you might even empty all your wallet for that bottle. Lacks or even crores, depending on how badly you want to continue living and how much you can afford to lose. So, the price of that bottle, which was mere rupees 20, has now become the most valuable thing in this time of need. As you can see then, the value is decided by your need, sometimes even by your greed. And not all deals of value need to be made based on logic alone, else one might lose the rare opportunity he has. In that case, if one is willing to lose the opportunity, then it is fine. But if not, then sometimes you have to pay more than what things are really worth off. You can see this in cases of real estate, where the prices of land or house are calculated roughly at the rates prescribed by the government or via the law of demand and supply, considering factors like location, climate and the facilities available nearby. But all this is theoretical. 
in reality people deal with emotions sometimes they have an attachment to their house and don't sell even if someone is willing to pay them twice the price similar is this emotion when buying an apartment that people might even pay more to reserve a spot in that place just because they like it if rationality alone was the guide and numbers alone were the rules then robots and algorithms would be in the top list of investors but we know that the market is functioning with emotions as much as it is functioning with numbers this isn't to say that valuation or rationality has no place in the market it does because sometimes market gets overwhelmed with irrationality either too pessimistic or too optimistic which rationally we can say is unacceptable and will burst like the case we saw in the tulip mania or the dot com crisis When you see the world renounce common sense you know that they are reaching a stage of insanity which is harmful for them as well as the society as a whole hence price is what the market dictates for a product or an asset but its value is what an individual decides for himself price is objective while value is subjective it is different for everyone you can quarrel bargain or argue with regard to the price of an object but we can never settle on the argument of value the reason is that we all have our own conceptions about value a thing which is valuable to me may not be valuable to you even though we agree about its price theoretically take an example of a pen whose market price is rupees 500 because it is of a well known brand and is coated with gold this then we call the cost of that pen but see how the value of that pen changes depending on the circumstances if the pen belongs to my dead grandfather and is the only pen he gave me then all of a sudden it will turn priceless due to my emotional attachment if the pen belongs to a popular celebrity and is being auctioned then again it might be sold at sky high rates since the fans buying it are willing to pay as one can see value changes with time to time person to person and situation to situation even though the product is the same or its manufacturing cost remains the same in order to avoid this clash of opinions these judgments of value most things sold in the economy are priced on the law of demand and supply you pay more if you need more and pay less if the demand for it is less this solves the problem of value completely but over time this has turned into a habit we no longer understand what an object really is worth unless it has a price tag today expensive is seen as an object of value and quality while cheap is considered downgraded people come with the same expectations in the stock market When they see stocks like Reliance, TCS, MRF, Hero Motor Corp, etc., they feel that these stocks are more valuable because they are some of the best companies in India. While there are also people who come to the stock market like they are here to buy groceries, they ignore the stocks of big companies since their stock appears pricey and they look out for stocks below 100. If one has started his investment with rupees 5000 then he can either choose to buy two shares of a company which is renowned and has a price of rupees 2500 per share or he can choose to buy 200 shares of a company whose shares are each of rupees 25 most people then prefer quantity over quality but the fact is the price of an asset tells you nothing about its value A stock that is trading at 25 or 2500 is both trading only because of the law of demand and supply. The price is rupees 25 because there is less demand while the supply is more. 2500 because there is high demand and the supply is low. Things like price don't tell you anything about business's profit, debt, cash flow, growth, management nothing 
The price of the stock only tells you that people are buying and selling it at that rate and it keeps fluctuating daily on their trades. On a day-to-day -day basis, fundamentally, there is no change in the business of the company. But due to the news, people's assumptions, their speculations, etc., all keep fluctuating the price of the stock moment to moment. No one cares what value is and what they are buying or selling as long as they keep making money. This has made the stock market into a sophisticated form of casino. People go there for fun and to try their luck. What most people don't seem to understand is that stocks are pieces of ownership which is why they are also called as equities. When you buy a stock, you are for a while the shareholder of that company and are legal beneficiary of the company's growth and its profits. Stocks give you a chance to be part of the businesses you would have loved to run or own, which is why you should think as a businessman. Think like you are buying a business instead of thinking that you are buying its shares. Think that the whole business belongs to you and see the shift in thoughts when you start thinking this way. When you are buying the stock of Reliance Industries, then imagine yourself as an opponent who is trying to buy the business completely from Ambani. How would you decide the worth of that company? What price would you pay to Mukesh Ambani if you truly had the money to take over his business? Think. What price would you pay if you had all the money to buy not one, two or three shares of Reliance but all the shares that are out there? What price would you choose if you could become not one, two or three percent shareholder but hundred percent of Reliance Industries? the sole owner of that company. If we total all the shares outstanding of Reliance Industries and multiply it by the current price of the share of Reliance, then we get a number. Number which represents the amount we need to pay to buy 100% shares of Reliance. If you have that amount, you can buy 100% of Reliance and take over. For instance, assume that the amount is 10 lakh crore. Would you buy? Is the price of 10 lakh crore justified for Reliance? If you want the pricer to be lesser, then what is its reason? How do you reach a conclusion? Normally, when we buy other financial assets like gold, farm, house or apartment, we don't face this kind of problem. We buy it at the market rate because all people around us are buying at that rate and the chances of that price falling below the price at which we have bought is also low. Hence, we don't consider the above questions. But with stocks, such is not the case. If you buy today, there is no guarantee whether it will rise tomorrow. It could also go down and down. There is no control or no assurance. So, if you buy the stock at a certain price, you should know and believe that the price at which you have bought is the right price. You should be able to justify your transaction even if its price is falling and if your assumption is right and correct. Then no matter how down it goes, one day it shall recover and give you a decent return. If the business grows naturally, the price of its stock will also grow. But there are instances where, due to certain factors, stocks go down and also rise up based only on the expectations of people, as we saw in the cases throughout the book. You see, there are two ways to value a business. First, based on the present, and second, based on its future. If you want to value reliance, for instance, then you can make a sum total of all its assets like factories, buildings, vehicles, etc. and can come to a number. Now, if Reliance has debt, then you can deduct this amount from the total of assets, which will again give you a number. Like assets in total minus a debt slash liabilities in total equal to the value of Reliance. But this would be unfair since this calculation involves only tangible things. What about the brand value of Reliance? What about the customer base it already has? And what about its future earnings? Therefore, there is another way where you can predict the future profits of the company for say next 10 years. Make total of those profits, 
adjust that amount with inflation and give it to ambani stating that all what he could earn for next 10 years from reliance is given to him by you and so let him hand over his company to you this is synonymous to a deal between a builder who buys a particular house from you by giving you the full price of the house by current asset price as well as the rent of the future 10 years by giving you these examples i simply am trying to teach you the way of thinking and how businesses are valued in reality there are lot more factors when you consider buying a business which again is beyond the scope of this chapter if you want to get a real world view then simply see a house deal being carried out or a shop deal being carried out or you could even try buying a business in your imagination from a famous businessman of india think how would you price the business of tata motors what price would you pay to buy facebook from zuckerberg think of businesses that you like and seem to understand no one doesn't literally have to buy these businesses from these people or maybe one day you will be until then maintain this attitude as they say fake it till you make it now the foremost reason why we buy businesses is for profit therefore we should choose a business which is always better than the current opportunities we have which is called the opportunity cost so what are the general opportunities we have we can buy gold land farm house make a fixed deposit in a bank or buy fixed income assets like bonds considering the average and leaving out the exceptions the stock market has overall given better returns than any other assets out there so in a way the stock market is the best possible option to invest now some might also argue that the current cryptocurrencies like bitcoin have given exceptional returns than the stock market and you are totally right and here we have to make a distinction between investing and gambling there are even apps like fantasy sports which can turn your tens into crores if you win the contest they tell you that it is based on skill but it is not you see the basic difference between an act of gambling and a skillful activity like investing is that of expertise it is not a matter of chance but effort if you practice throwing a dice for 10 or even 20 years of your life you won't get better at it the dice will fall as it always has no skill can make you achieve the number which you have in mind on the dice similarly with the game of cards casinos or lotteries you cannot get expert at it no matter how much time you spend practicing it but games like cricket chess etc you get better at those as you spend more time playing with those while cards snakes and ladders or ludo are all games of luck chance and fate which is why we call them acts of gambles similarly it is when trading in stocks no amount spent speculating them will make you better at predicting the movement of stocks saying that you can predict the stock movement is like saying that one knows how the majority of the market will react of course there are instances where based on certain news facts or announcements we can conclude that the stock may react in a certain way but there is always that amount of risk involved the risk of losing your money which we saw in most of our kinds of multibaggers therefore some multibaggers in our book were just ways of speculating and trying to beat the odds but one cannot and should not term it as an investment the moment you learn that the transaction involved has a risk of losing your principal then you are not investing but simply gambling i also don't want to discourage you from performing such acts because this sort of speculation is necessary it is this speculation in the market which maintains liquidity it gives birth to volatility and also an opportunity to take advantage of such irrationality if we all start investing and holding stocks forever then there won't be anyone to buy stocks from or anyone to sell stocks to it is your money and one is free to do whatever he wishes to do with it as long as it is legal 
But before the end, I wanted to clear that I personally don't support the acts of gambling as a means to grow or do business. You can do it for fun, but if you are hoping to build a career on that premise, then your failure is inevitable. You see, earning money is easy, but maintaining it and growing it is harder, which most people lack. That is why 90% of lottery winners go bankrupt in just a few years of their glory. It is their inability to manage the money and to sustain it which got them buying lotteries in the first place. If you take a look at our kinds of multibaggers, then there are certain multibaggers that are valuation proof. That is, you may not need to value them on a scale. For example, the evergreen and sure shot multibaggers very know that the companies have bright futures and are here to stay. So with our questions, we have eliminated the need to value them based on numbers. It isn't to say that valuation is no longer needed. It will always be needed because situations like bubbles and high optimism overinflate the prices of even the greatest evergreen and sure shot companies. All you have to do is use your common sense before placing your bets. Whereas multibaggers like Lightnings short-term sure shot, rumored, industrial, demand supply, etc. have no connection with valuation whatsoever. They are pure cases of speculation based on certain signs to increase the possibility of profit. Throughout the book, we saw that multibaggers are not only the result of valuation discrepancies, but news, bubbles, bust, announcements, and so on. Some multibaggers are momentary, some weekly, monthly, while some stay so for years. So, opportunities to make money are everywhere. Some may prefer the safer route, while some the riskier. So, I leave it up all to you. Choose what you prefer and begin your journey. If you are truly interested in valuations, then as a complimentary book for this topic, I would suggest you to read Value Investing in 30 Minutes, which also is a book written by me and can be found in digital form on Google Books or Amazon Kindle Edition. The book will complement your knowledge on this subject of multibaggers and valuations. It is a short read which justifies the title and can teach you a lot, an overview on valuation of assets. Let us then meet in our next and final chapters which shall mark the end of our study of multibaggers and investing. Chapter 29 Skill of Portfolio Management Quote If you know what to do when your stock is up and know what to do when the stock is down, you have pretty much understood the game of investing. Unquote by Kalpesh Suryavanshi. We have come a long journey and this is the last stage of our study. Just like valuation, portfolio management is also an important part of investing and just like valuation, this too is a deeper topic and so here I will discuss it in brief and highlight its need. What is a portfolio first of all? Portfolio in simpler terms is just a group or collection of your financial assets. For example, if you have two bikes and one car at your house, then we would say it is your portfolio of vehicles. If you have, say, shares of 10 companies, then we would call it your stock portfolio. This way, there are various ways of arranging a portfolio. You can put stocks, bonds, gold, mutual funds or even real estate in your portfolio. Mind you, a portfolio is just an imaginary concept where we group our assets in the proportion of their value. If you own a house to live only, then we won't consider it as a part of your portfolio. But if you have an apartment from which you generate rent, then we could use it as a part of your financial portfolio. Let us simplify it more. Suppose you have an apartment which you use to earn rental income and its market value at which you bought it is 10 lakh rupees. You have gold jewellery of 1 lakh rupees and your stocks are worth 5 lakh rupees. 
then we can say that your portfolio value is 16 lakh rupees. Now, we can say that 62.5% of your portfolio consists of your apartment, that is 10 lakh, 6.25% of your investment is in gold, that is 1 lakh, and 31.25% of your wealth is in stocks, that is 5 lakh. This way of looking at things gives a proper view and we can analyze our risks accordingly. If we feel that we have put a greater part of capital in a risky asset, then we can reduce it and if we feel we have put a lesser amount in a rewarding asset, then we can increase the percentage. You see, valuing stocks or finding multibaggers alone is not enough to make wealth because the key is proper asset allocation which is what portfolio management is all about. Say you have rupees 5000. How do you invest it? In what proportion? How much money should you invest out of it in Reliance and how much in Tata Motors? Answer to all these are given by portfolio management. Sometimes you may find a multi-bagger but due to lack of understanding in portfolio management, you may invest only 100 rupees out of your 5000 rupees in it. Now, if that stock doubles from 100 to 200, then it has only increased the value of your portfolio by 2%, whereas the individual return was 100%. Also, it happens that we, in overconfidence, invest our total portfolio in one asset, and when it halves, our portfolio also halves. In these cases then, a skill of proper portfolio management is essential. Finding and exploring multi-baggers alone will not be sufficient if you can allocate a proper percentage of capital to it. Some companies will deserve your capital more because of their growth prospects, while some companies may deserve less capital because of the risks they come with. In mutual funds, there are already trained people who allocate your capital based on their proportions predetermined. For example, a large cap mutual fund will allocate a greater part of capital to companies that are in large cap. Small cap mutual funds will do so in small caps and so on. So, there is the one way of allocating the capital based on the market cap of the companies. Large caps are generally companies that are stable and involve lesser risk, while small caps are companies which may involve higher risk but also large growth potential. There is also a category called mid-caps, which are companies neither large nor small but have combined attributes of both large cap and small cap. To understand and see their practicality, one can check any site of mutual funds and understand how they classify their capital. Another way to approach this is what I would call the confidence method, where you allocate your capital in the percentage of your confidence in it. If you think Reliance is going to make big in the next 10 years and you are 100% sure of it, and you also know that it is the best opportunity than all the opportunities you have at your hand, then you can invest 100% of your portfolio in that company. If you are only 70% confident, then invest only 70% of your money. If your surety is only 50%, then allocate only half of what you have. This approach is suitable when investing in multi-baggers like Valuation, Evergreen and SureShot. Next, you could take the method of risk percentage, which is sustainable when you are engaging yourself in the acts of speculation like that of rumor, demand, supply, lightning, etc. How much do you think is the risk of losing your capital in that trade? If you think you could lose 100% of your money, then allocate only 2% capital of your portfolio. If you think you could lose 90%, then invest 4%. If the loss could be 80% capital, then 6%, so on and so forth. This way, at most with the risk of losing 10% capital, you will invest only 18% of your holdings and not more. Even if you then lose this amount, you can recover it by investing the leftover in fixed income bonds in 2-3 to three years. 
Next approach is the one used by balanced mutual funds who diversify your risk based on your age. For younger people, they invest a greater proportion in equities, while for older people, they invest a larger part in fixed income assets like bonds. For example, 80% equities for young people and 20% in bonds, while 80% in bonds for old people and 20% in equities. This way, there are numerous such approaches to portfolio management and their list is endless. And I wouldn't get into that topic as it is beyond the scope of this book. But it is also important to address that issue without which our study remains incomplete. From my personal experience, I have figured out that none of the portfolio management methods seems to work unless you add your own intellect into it. It is only us who know what our expectations are and what kind of loss we can suffer. We know our capacity to generate rate and our tolerance to suffer loss, which is what portfolio management is all about. Unless you sit down and decide what kind of goal you want to achieve, what kind of return you ought to make, you cannot settle on any portfolio. It is like buying a car. To buy it first, you have to know your budget. What purpose are you buying it for? Commercial or personal? Will you take it on longer trips or shorter? Do you want it as luxurious or one that will fulfill the basic need? Similar kinds of questions will need to be addressed for your portfolio. Like your goal, your satisfactory interest, the risk you can take for it, etc. Hence, no model portfolio could help but it could give you some basic ideas which I am trying to give by examples. Thus, teaching someone to create his portfolio, for me, is like telling someone to put sugar or salt in his cup or plate. These things depend on personal preference and as far as some examples and models are concerned, I have given you some hints. Keep in mind that asset allocation is the most important part of investing. Finding a multibagger is just the first step, a baby step I would say. You will have to decide how much percentage of your holding you want to allocate to a certain company and how much you should spend on your speculative activity. Speculative trades not often but rarely may give you exceptional kinds of returns but they may also take away your principal if things go sideways which is why I would say to allocate only a small proportion of your capital, perhaps less than 10% to that overall section. On the other hand, if you find multibaggers like Evergreen or SureShot, then one can even allocate more than 50% of his portfolio to this kind, while cases like Industrial, Thematic and Inverse may range from 10-15% to of your portfolio. Keep in mind all the above percentages are just references and not ideal numbers of allocation. After reading the book, you have sufficiently overcome the first problem the problem of finding multibagger stocks. Now you know how to think and where to fish, but the hustle never ends. One has to keep learning and the next thing or further problem you would face is about the amount and percentage or allocation of capital which is a deeper subject. Perhaps after the success of this book and on people's demand, I might bring up a new book on portfolio management. But until then, good luck on your exploration of multibaggers and hope you keep growing our field of study by your own contributions. Chapter 30 Parting Words Quote, When your mind is free, no prison in this world can lock you up. Unquote by Kalpesh Suryavanshi. Thank you for being patient and for keeping up with me throughout our journey of multibaggers. Hope I have contributed something in this field of investment and wish that you too succeed. India is growing. The youth today are getting financially literate and over time you will need people to guide you who will be honest and transparent in their approach. 
but sadly when people reach a state of popularity or fame they care more about their own reputation they have that fear of falling down and so they choose diplomatic ways and often refrain from stating the truth i right now am not in such a position and have no one to impress which is why i could say what i wanted to say with bluntness and complete honesty i also understand some people may find loopholes or mistakes in this work which is healthy criticism and i do appreciate people who read with an open mind instead of trusting the authority of the author which is i welcome you to submit your review on amazon or flipkart about this book so i could correct the flaws which will also help other people to grow also if you like this work then don't forget to give such feedback on e-commerce sites which will encourage other people to read this work thank you